Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with foreign or fewer people with an HR platform while providing you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Taban Cosmos. Taban, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Taban's life purpose, his why, is to impact the world through technology and innovation globally and create sustainable solutions that serve humanity. Taban is a CTO and co-founder of Guide, the B2B learning and talent development platform, helping remote teams and wouldn't be knowledge workers learn anytime, anywhere on demand. He's a Sudanese refugee, an accomplished global technology and product leader, and world-renowned public speaker. Taban, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Justin, for having me on. Yes. Uh, so we met a couple years ago when I was with Bunko Labs. You, you helped did a, we did like a little speed mentoring session with Bunko Labs, and I want to thank you for helping out with that. That was a great event that you helped out with. Exactly. I remember that very well. So first, um, are you still with the Central Washington University Startup Program? That's something you started, right? Is that, is that still going on? Yeah, um, I haven't really confirmed if it's actually still going on, but uh, um, the last time I left is the last time I knew um, how that club was doing. Um, we started basically to kind of like bring the students together so they can build like new products and stuff. Um, and so um, we had a couple of like really good uh, turnout. Uh, we actually had the largest, I would say, hackathon in, in Eastern Washington or Central Washington, if you will, um, and uh, with the support of all my professors and all the other like, you know, smart people. Um, but uh, since I left, um, I have not had uh, heard any uh, sort of like reviving of the club. So it's uh, been a while then? It's been forever. Uh, it's been like close to uh, close to six years, I would oh, wow. say. Yeah, or five years. Um, but, you know, um, I still mingle with the students and I still mingle with the professors because uh, I, I sort of like built this, you know. Because that's where you graduated from, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's why. I, uh, so short story, I haven't completed all my studies, but... Uh, I, I did the walking and and as soon as I finished the walking, uh, GE hired me as a product uh, uh, senior technical product manager. So I was I was working already at, at at GE as a product you know person and they told me that it's fine you can do whatever you want but you know if you want to get it done it's it's up to you. So um, I don't think that's exactly what they said, but um, to them they're like you can do whatever you want, right? And so. I decided not to even finish my last class and I'm like, okay, we're good. Cause I've met like, I don't know, 10% of people that I was working with didn't have a college degree. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is sweet. I know I like the college thing is different now, right? I mean, cause I, I don't say college is a scam, but you know, like the cost increased by 10,000%, you know? And like, I don't know, like, like, like people say all the time, you want to be a doctor lawyer, you need a college, but you know, tech, you know, maybe business, maybe you really need it, you know, like you want to be a designer, do you really need college? I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, to be honest with you, um, if I had a different um, direction when I started college, because I've been to college for at least six years, I would say, because I took off, you know, a year in between deciding if, you know, finishing my degree was, you know, vital for my success, right? But then I realized that, um, now just working in the industry, if I were to like focus my energy on something else that I feel like I could do really well, which is products, um, I wouldn't even need a degree. I would say that, um, there's some skills that you definitely don't, but if you're going to be a computer scientist, which is close to what I was going for, um, then you would probably need the college degree because the things that you, the access that you get, uh, at a, a university is, is different from when you're just building a startup is you could have a lot of great ideas, but, you know, execution is, you know, the name of the game. I mean, I think college still good, like the social networking part, right? You know, meeting people you might not have ever met, you know, I think it's good for that. So you've been in tech for a while. From your point of view, is it better to be a, go complete a coding academy or do the four-year computer science degree? Do you see any, any difference in those, those two things? Uh, I would say um, it really depends on the person, to be honest. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is I don't really want to say that college degree or just going the, you know, the, the traditional direction is, you know, the worst or the best or the boot camp, the worst or the best. Uh, but I think it's more sort of like, if you have the right mentality to, um, accomplish something that you feel is of, your, of, of an interest to you, um, if you go to boot camp, uh, depending on, you know, what kind of courses you're taking there, it would get you there. Right. Um, 
will you miss some things as far as like you know um computer science data structure and you know engineering things yes you would um but you would have an early start to actually think about product in a complete sense because you are actually building things right um i would say that the the perks that comes with having a traditional uh, degree is that uh, also again it 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 down to the person right so if if you spend enough time knowing exactly what you want to do because in college you would have probably like multiple options to be a uh, an ai engineer or to be a data science engineer or whatever that is um you can focus your 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 energy on that um but when i was in college none of that was there so we were just doing like you know computer science degree if you will well, from your point of view what makes what characteristics does successful software engineers software developers have um they they build things every day they practice they work with people um i've certainly worked a lot on my own but i've worked with i've collaborated with people um and so if you like to collaborate if you like to think about ideas and just continue to build it um on a regular basis um i think that will set you apart so uh, there's a stereotype out there that software developers they're working the corner by themselves 10 hours a day don't talk to anyone that's further from the truth right if you're a good developer you actually have to be a good collaborator right oh yeah i mean there's really no building something if you're not talking to anyone right um <laughs> you're not building the product for yourself you're building it for the, your customers right you run an organization when you are building it you're not thinking that i'm the one jason going to use my own product but you you know that there is a uh, need for yourself but if you're going to build it for the mass then you need people that are actually communicating with each other so communication is definitely a big part of uh, building or you know being a good software engineer you just you know we're not always hiding ourselves in the <laughs> corner you do you tend to do that only when you're focused on the product that, you know, on the specific task you're working on so uh, what advice you have for new developers trying to find a job like right now it's like you know junior developers they're having like they're getting killed out there right Can most jobs say they have to take like i don't know like i'm making this up like no 10 hour coding tests white whiteboard tests they want like a job to say 2 3 years experience for an internship you know so what advice you have these people hey you know like yeah <laughs> i trust me i've been struggling with that too as well i i'm i'm going to say that from personal uh, uh you know a uh, perspective um i think if somebody's new or you know just looking to get new job in the industry um i would say that um getting familiar with um uh with your data structures is definitely the only answer to passing interviews i've been doing interviews i've done one with walmart i've done one with google before that was like a couple of years ago when i was doing a product at ge um to be honest with you i've seen how hard it can be um you definitely have to like focus you have to spend you know considerable amount of time uh people that want to work for these big companies like you know the fang um there's definitely a lot of sweat to be put there cuz the rate of you getting accepted at those companies is probably smaller than actually wanting to get into Stanford or something like that. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. Yeah. So, I I know a lot of developers they complain about these whiteboard tests, right? Do they have a reason to complain or is this the way the business is done right now? So, I would say that um it really depends um how you, you know, how you frame, you know, your uh your solution, right? Um definitely matters, but having the whiteboard basically allows you to be able to think um in in boxes and yeah that's what they say in 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 software engineering you think in boxes you you draw little boxes and then you point arrows to other boxes that you know explains what components link to what components or what dependencies lead to what dependencies so it allows you to understand the whole cuz like you know building software is a mental thing so you always have a mental picture in your head right and you're writing code that doesn't really have anything to do with the <laughs> with the with the boxes but it allows you to be able to communicate to other peers um what exactly you're thinking what do you look for when you bring on software developers for the company you're working with um usually i i i don't do like the traditional interview style um i will ask them to show me products that they have built or something that they've worked on um I, and then i would say um how um let's say i'll say you know are they 
team players like can they um can they you know uh talk about the ideas or talk about the problem that they're working on in a way that i can understand in a way that my clients can understand right so uh that is sort of like the the gist of the top you know the, the sort of like the top of the cream right but <clears throat> everything else could be you know like they know javascript or they know go or they know html and react and stuff like that then we can kind of like narrow it down um, um and then the other approach uh, on top of that is i would give them a one week project or a two day project that i know can be done in that time so if they do it right then i will physically have a conversation so how do you or how do you recommend people keep up, date, up, up to date with tech right because like tech is like changing on a daily basis right how do you keep up with everything uh so my girlfriend thinks i I am always like doing something um, and it's true because I'm doing something, but most of it is not just work. It's actually learning. Um, I buy so many books to sort of like understand the things that I not exposed to. Cause like as in, in startup, you are really in a different world. You're trying to get products done. Um, but then also as you're getting credit products done, let's say, let's say in the web three space, right? Like how far are you familiar with web three, right? Um, so you find yourself uh, reading at all time, um, whatever articles that people put out there. For me, I follow people that are, I would say, leaders in those space, just sort of like to ingest as much information as I could from them. Um, but that's from the higher level. But from the technical part, things don't change as much, to be honest. Um, from the technical part, um, the only thing that you, you know, as a software engineer, you, you just want to practice optimization, practice new problems, uh, try new problems to just get better at solving, you know, harder problems. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, I think what I would say. Who, who are some tech people that you follow? Uh, you want me to name drop? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I follow Jonathan, one of my good friends. Uh, he's, he's big in the, um, the tech space. Uh, I f Jonathan Blanco. Yeah. Jonathan okay. Blanco. I follow him a lot. He's, I like his content. I follow Chad. Uh, he's in the uh, uh, chat, uh, chat, uh, chat bot and voice AI. And I think now he's also in Web3. Mm -hmm. um, I follow Adam Grant. Uh, he's, he's more onto the, uh, what do you call the, uh, the EQ okay. of, of, of work, right? So it's good to understand how to, um, how to be empathetic, how to solve problems without creating conflict, right? So, or how to solve conflict mm -hmm. without, really going into more conflict. So I like that. I, I, that's not helpful, but that's helpful to me yes. because then it grounds me down mm -hmm. when I'm actually uh, collecting more information so I don't get frustrated. Why am I learning this right now? <laughs> well, I could just be doing something else, right? Um, and then I'm following this one person. I forgot his name, but he posts a lot about AI. Mm -hmm. And of course I follow you too. <laughs> you, you post a lot of good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So Johnson, he got big rubbing the NFT space, didn't he? Yes. Oh my goodness. He. When he started uh, this brand uh, tokenization thing with NFT, that was, a, that was a big pivot for him. What he was doing before, I think. Oh, absolutely! Remember when um, when people were saying about unfungible, but they weren't talking about NFT, yeah. like the way we talk about mm -hmm. it today. Yeah, there was a company that just started. That was like in 2018. Um, I don't know the status of that organization, but it was literally in line. I read their white paper; it blew my mind away. Mm -hmm. And now I'm seeing him doing NFT. I'm like, it's just no brainer. He yeah. should be doing it, right? Because he he's already thinking about it in that light already. Yeah, he posts a lot of good stuff out there. Oh, absolutely. Um. So what what's what's your so what's the difference from your point of view doing tech for a corporate corporation for a corporation and a startup? Uh. So, <clears throat> as far as like what like the difference of how I handle it? Yeah. Um. I have worked. Let me see. Have I worked with any corporation? I don't think I've worked with any bigger corporations at the scale that I'm in mm -hmm. right now. But I've been also working with people that have something or have uh, have something or have nothing. Um, and so those are the people that I build up, right? So um, I basically come in as a liaison to understand what the problem is, and then able to um, kind of like create you know if there's a problem you create the problem right mm -hmm. so you can solve the problem so we know what the problem is then we sort of like create more problems around the problem and then then get you know find solutions because you know 
one answer is not always true so you have to find more answers in order to sell for one that is you know good as far as like building it for what kind of you know customers and what kind of tech needs to be used um all that kind of stuff i am trying to work with bigger corporations uh but uh to lend that i think i would need a bigger team uh, currently it's just me and some contractors that I work with. So there's really no, uh, what, what is it? Uh, there's no, um, uh, what do you call bandwidth? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if someone's getting their first uh, software development job, we recommend them go to startup or go to a big company. Um, I'm going to ask you that. Let me, let me write, redirect the question okay. to you. What would you think? I mean, you've been in this space yeah. more than, longer than I have been. What, what's, what's your thoughts? I mean, I think there's two points of view. One is like, go to like a Google, get the money, and then become established, and then go to stop. That way you go to stop. Just, hey, I'm ex-Google, I'm ex-Amazon, right? Because mm -hmm. that means that makes it sexy, right? Yeah. But then again, you go to Google or Fang, so to speak, you're going to do one thing over and over again. And what are you really going to learn, right? Yeah. Unless true. you're self-motivated and learn your own, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you go to startup, pretty much going to say, build this for me. Yeah. Like, I don't care how you do it, just build it for me, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think it's pros and cons. Of course. Has to go with the family background and stuff, you know. Can you like, so can you afford like they'll take a year off and be unpaid, right? So yeah. each situation. So that's basically a great question. I always ask some, well, most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say there's two situations. Yeah. We we'll say everything the race, everything is the same, right? Yeah. One person graduated from college, mm -hmm. came from a middle class income, a family, didn't have to pay for college, and they can afford like take a year off from college, you know, work for a startup. So they take a year off, work for a startup. And you know, in the startup because of unicorn rights, they get a lot of money. Yeah. Other person come from a single parent household on welfare, had like work, had to work two or three jobs to go to college. Uh -huh. When he graduates, he can't take no time off. Uh -huh. He has to get a job. Uh -huh. and of course, the job you get paid will say ninety thousand dollars a year because that takes family, right? Yeah. I mean, is there a way to fix that? Because like the outcome is not the same, right? Or, or is this where the system is? Uh -huh. What do you think? Well, I mean. Um... Just to piggyback from what you said earlier about the, uh, you know, how to get yourself, you know, started. Should you go to, you know, the corporate or go to to startup? I think to answer a question, we'll answer it that way. Um, I think one, your background definitely matters in terms of like what you're about to do next. Um, and when I say it matters, I mean I'm saying that the decision that you make is gonna impact you in a different way, right? Um, some decisions that people are making as far as like startups, uh, where let's say they grew up in a, um, I would say middle-class family, um, it's easier because they can ask for seed money from the parents or from their friend's parent, right? Uh, because that circle probably maybe have heard of something like that and they have already lived a life of, you know, middle-class, you know, um, income family. Um, so they know what it is to be able to, you know, use money to make more money. Well, on the other hand, somebody who is, you know, who's from, you know, a very struggling family, I would let me call it that way. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard for them to actually even see the end goal. Like they just want to be successful and they're trying to figure out how to get successful. The first, the first uh, step of the way is I'll get my college degree. I, I, I cannot afford to flunk my college. Um, I have to get it done. Um, and then I have to get a job that really pays well before I even think about my startup. But if they think about their startup and they have a good network, now, again, it comes to the network, right? So if you have a network that is ready to help you to succeed, um, you're more likely to find yourself not thinking about the decision that I just said, right? Like, should I finish college first or should I go directly to um, uh, to startup or should I go get a job first, like you said earlier, get a $90,000 or $100,000 job first, be comfortable for about a year or two years or three years. And then whatever the idea is that you want to, that you have had in your mind to build, then you can sit down and sort of like build it, right? Because then you have a cushion. Um, I think I was that guy. <laughs> so I had to work for a couple of companies first. Um, I had to um, I had to work for other startups to learn how the game is done. Because from the beginning, since I was a kid, I always want to be my own boss. <laughs> you know, yes. like I wanted to be my own boss, but I wasn't brought up in an environment that allows me to think that way. Right. But, you know, people know me already like 
I'm not like the weird dude that always stays in the corner that does his or you know his own thing and whatnot. Like I'm on people's face. Even if like I'm in the corner doing something, it's gotta be a good thing, right? Like I I'm doing something that I know I care about that no one really cares about. So um I think um at the end of the you know the the, the game really is about you know relationship building. Um I was fortunate enough to be able to build a relationship with people and it's it's afforded me to be able to uh get hired you know by some of these you know good companies because of the relationship that i've built with people and also you know just grinding my skills away yeah it always kills me when people say you know go to your family friends or family friends around right like no, no most people don't have family friends like that because hey hey uncle tom or uncle jason can you go loan me a hundred thousand dollars like most people don't have that it always kills me people like uh, before you start raising they'll get a fun family friendly family friendly round yeah or it kills me. Oh yeah, no, that's 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 the hardest part about just startup. I think if if there's anything you talk about the system, I think there's there's so many things we could improve if we wanted to like have you know multiple voices heard, right? Like we could we could you know increase the we could reduce the barrier of entry and reduce or increase the barrier of entry. <laughs> um, we have to just increase the amount of people, you know, getting into those fields first. I think that's one thing that I, I see a gap. Um, when I was at college, there was only like three of us, like the three of us were all from different countries in the computer science department, right? And there was only like one female in there. So, and I'm looking, I'm like, no wonder why the success rate you can have in the field is going to be very small if you have small representation in in the college itself right and so that one has to be fixed how it's fixed i don't really know i think it's i think for me we have to go to all the communities out there you know poor under you know uh people who are poor you know, lower middle class um or even middle class, because like there's only very few people in the middle class that actually would prefer to go do computer science degree, right? Unless or otherwise their uncle, their somebody, you know, showing like, oh, they went to computer science and, and worked for Microsoft or Boeing or whatever. So that becomes sort of like a narrative, like when like, oh, my uncle worked for Boeing. Oh, cool. How do I work at Boeing? Oh, yeah, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to study mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and whatever. Most communities don't have that. Very few. Yeah, especially like ones like, like rural areas, country areas. Yeah. No, no one is thinking that way. Even in, in, in rural America, trust me, I've been to places where when when I say that $100,000 in Seattle is poverty level, they look at me, they're like, wow, if we were making $100,000 here, we yeah. would be living large. Living in a mansion with 10 acres of land. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See? Um, anyways. <laughs> um, so you, you, when you start out, you're a software intern, right? What lessons do you learn from that that, that experience that to set you up for success? Um, I think it it depends too. I, I like my answers are going to be always all it depends <laughs> because I'm I'm trying to give perspective to people that you know have or hasn't um, or haven't. Um, I I would say that um, personally, I think I have learned um, how to ask questions. I feel like when I was interning, I had so many questions. But also the thing is, as an intern, you are asking questions out of frustration because you don't know what it is. Um, and so that becomes a problem, right? So you, you have to find a way to sort of like dig into the information a little bit more, you know, on the project that you're working on as, a, as, a, as, a, as an intern, um, try to understand what the problem is. The more you do that, then the questions that you're asking are definitely going to help you to succeed um, in terms of like just learning and and just being professional around other professionals. Are you still part of the thing called CTO Connect? Yes, I am actually. I uh, it's run by Peter. I actually follow Peter a lot. Um, okay. That's one person that I need to mention. I, have you have you met Peter? No, I don't think I have. Oh, What's his last name? Oh my God, Bell. No, I don't think I've met him. Yeah, Peter Bell. So Peter Bell is really cool. Um, he invited me to one of his uh, CTO Connect, and I give a speech there about emerging technology and stuff like that. Um, not as emerging technology, but like merging things mm -hmm. together. Uh, there's a name for that. I don't know. There's another word for merging that people use a lot. Intersection, intersectionality of technology, something like that. Um, yeah, he's, he's good. Um, 
Is this like a nationwide organization? I think it's global. Global. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, what they do is they they bring um, uh, they bring founders or not founders only, but leaders in whatever field they are. Uh, usually CTOs that have you know built billion dollar companies and those that just have you know some experience to share with the people because at the end of the day it's about sharing knowledge um insecurity and organizational building um um and all this kind of stuff so it's pretty cool how long you been involved with them um i think the last time i gave a conversation was 2019 okay yeah 2019 2020 2020 i think 2020 yeah Actually, no, 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 sorry. 2019. 2019? Yeah, because 2020 is when COVID happened. Yeah. So yeah. I don't remember that part. Talk about the importance of like software, not just software developers, but people in general being able to publicly speak. So I'm not really a born public speaker, but people tell me that I can do it. I just... Um, That's I an important skill to have, right? It's an important skill. I mean, as a, as a leader in your space, um, it's... You know how they say that elders are supposed to teach the young ones? Mm -hmm. That's literally what it, it is. Like you have so much knowledge accumulated over the years. Why not share that with people? And I think um, this allows us to be able to have that forum or this, you know, um, uh, fire, uh, fire something chat um, so that we can kind of like pass the knowledge that we have to the younger generation or to anyone else who might need that. Because at the end of the day, if you don't write blogs, uh, then no one knows, you know, what kind of brilliant things you have in your mind. Yeah, I tell people all the day, like when they search for a job or the case may be, like you got yourself out there, do a blog, do something, right? Oh my goodness. It kills me if people say, well, oh, look, what's up? You know, people are like, I don't, I don't put myself out there. I'm too shy or, mm -hmm. you know, like, they don't, I mean, people get mad all the time. Oh, why should I do that, you know? Well, I guess they have the game works, unfortunately, right? No, that's true. I mean, that's very important that you said that. I think people need to know this. Confidence is, you're not born with confidence. Yeah. You build confidence. If you grew up in a uh, in an environment where confidence is shied off or people don't even like exhibit those traits, then you find yourself not willing to, right? And so... Every day when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I want to be confident today. Not because that I'm, I, I lack confidence. It's just that I want to be able to like say things and really mean them and say them in a way that um, kind of like shows that authenticity, right? Because if you're confident wanting something, you get it. That's literally how it is. You can be shy. You can get it still. But in most cases, you really have to just be like that person who is loud. Um, well people will take it a different way don't be that person who is loud but be like that person that you know knows this stuff like you want to want something physically how, how can people build up their confidence they don't if they lack that yeah that's a very good question i i don't really have any secrets or any um things that i follow that can build that up but i think it's more so of like you know kind of like digging into who you are right like what am i who am I? What do I want in this life? I think confidence can be built that way. Um, I think the moment you start to question yourself, things that you've never asked before, like I do this all the time, not all the time as in like every day, I just sit down there and like, who am I? What am I? What do I do? You know, but I am always thinking, what do I want to affect in this world, right? Can I, do I have that ability to do it? And, you know, the imposter syndrome is a thing. Yeah. And if you have imposter syndrome, it can cloud your confidence. Uh, and has, it has happened to me multiple times. And I think it still happens sometimes. I just have to fight it, right? There's, there's times that where I just, I, I'm solving a problem. And I'm like, why is this problem so hard? <laughs> who solved this problem, right? Like, let me go to the internet. Let me go see who is doing what. You know, and, you know, and sometimes we shy away from looking up things. That's the problem. We have to look up things if we don't really know. Because like the thing is, you can solve problems, but if you can't, if you find yourself taking so much time that you just don't really know, your brain is just like so done. Like you're like, I don't really know what to do here. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is there's something, it has something to do with confidence, right? If, if, you, if, if you feel like you're not good enough to be in front of somebody or good enough to even ask a girl out uh, or good enough to um, 
ask your coffee the right way <laughs> you know like i have this tendency when i i'm kind of like over the place here when i go to starbucks and i'm asking for my drink i would usually like i would like you know white chocolate america i would seem to have enough that's like my favorite <laughs> uh so i would say that but i'm not saying it looking at that person who's preparing it for me but when i look at them and i say it there is this sense of like wow this person is happy not happy only but this person is so like he knows what he wants and he wants it now kind of thing you know what i mean yeah. i have no idea that that makes sense but, makes sense. <laughs> but, but uh imposter syndrome is crazy when you like everyone has it right but when you hear other people get it you're like she had they have it because like a suni lee she won like an olympic gold medal overall best in the olympics she was talking about how right after she won olympic, olympic gold medal she had the imposter syndrome because mm-hmm. her mind like only we see one because someone bought someone bought bottles not compete right yeah and people are like you just won the freaking gold medal Olympic gold medal for the best gymnast in the world. Uh-huh. Like, how do you have imposter syndrome? But she like, no, I had this imposter syndrome. Uh-huh. And like, it's crazy. This person just won the gold medal and she has imposter syndrome thinking she's not the best in the world. I mean, it's like crazy, right? It's right on the money because people think that even if like you are the, like if you have billions of dollars, then you shouldn't have that. Like imposter syndrome is very common. It's, it's a thing that we have to just fight every day, right? Um, you achieve one greatness, but you can still achieve another greatness. Yeah. How do you overcome that? Right? Yeah. And how do you, how do you usually like motivate you, focus you versus like destroying you? Exactly. A lot of people let it destroy them. Oh yeah. Trust me with it. For me, uh, it's like when I'm building a, 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 what do you call it, an app and I'm just like, okay, I got everything done. Like all my lists, I'm looking at something, things that I've been working on. I'm like, okay, everything looks good. And then I realize there's something in them. Like, oh, I don't think this app is ready to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when people see it, you know, my clients are like, oh yeah, this looks really good. And I'm seeing them like, how, you know, you know, I, it, you know, like, but still I want to feel like I want to do better or I need to practice more. And so the more we kind of like push ourselves to that, we find, we, we, we end up doing greatness, but also, you know, it's because imposter syndrome is pushing it. But there's gonna be a time where you can say, I I should just accept the results now and and kind of like build on top of that results as opposed to like, you know. And are you are, are you an advisor for a fintech startup? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? Yeah, that's a that's that's an interesting one. So I think there was a time I was meeting up with a group of uh, young, you know, African entrepreneurs. Um, they have this new thing that connects other uh, African talents, um, you know, to build or to work on projects so that they can gain skills and work for other companies and whatnot. So it's like a networking group kind of thing, networking thing. Um, so as I was talking to the person who fo- founded it, he in- introduced me to another person um, who's like, what, 21, 18 at the, at the time? And so I was talking to him and uh, he, 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 was ta- he was telling me about this like thing that they're building. I'm like, oh, that sounds very cool. Uh, like, how can I help you guys? The thing about me is that I'm always open to like, you know, help mentor people if I think I can do it. One thing that I actually, again, back to imposter syndrome is that, you know, I asked myself the question, can I mentor other people, right? And I sat down, I'm like, maybe I can. Um, I can't sit down to like, uh, when I sit down to think about all the information that I know, I just, it's hard to remember everything. But when you start to talk about specific things, then you, the knowledge sort of like, there's a word for it. I don't really know what the word is, but all this ideas, knowledge and thing kind of like comes out and then you try, you, you, you're helping this person make decisions, right? Or you empower them to make better decisions. So anyways, um, I talked to him about the FinTech and um, they have a very good vision, and the vision is to um, improve SMEs, uh, transactions. Um, and they're in Seattle, right? Actually, no, they are based in Nigeria. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, they're based in Nigeria. So um, they are registered in London, um, based in Nigeria. Um, and how do you meet, meet, meet them? How do you link up with them, in, I mean, with them being in Nigeria? Uh, we do hangouts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but how do you meet them originally? Oh yeah, um, the way I met them is basically that story where I met this one guy who okay. who, who was um, doing this networking thing, and then he introduced me to this okay. one fellow, and this, and then he pitched to me, and I heard it, and then I gave him a couple more months to just kind of like think about it. He sent me his deck, and I look at it, and I'm like, hmm, looks looks. Saw good. something, just saw something in them. Oh my goodness, yeah. And the good thing is, 
he's a he's he's at that age trust me if i was at that at that age if i was like him i would have built a billion dollar company by now like not just billion like multiple billion dollar companies it's that, amazing what all these young people are doing nowadays you know like at 18 what are you thinking about the expansion of this technology throughout africa throughout the world how they can improve optimization you know in transaction um you know, reduce latency, all that kind of like just just things. I'm sitting. I'm like, when I was 18, I was still planning to come to the United States. Yeah, yeah. I probably hasn't haven't graduated my high school yet. Like, it was crazy. So I saw what they had, um, and I looked at his team, and they showed me a demo. So that was something. <laughs> I was like, oh, you guys have a demo already. Um, so for the last two years or one and a half years, something like that, I think I've been mm-hmm. working with them. Um, I've seen them make progress they want to be the venom of africa mm-hmm. and they're not far away they already have they're already getting support from bigger companies in africa um so that technology it can actually be used in the united states so if there's any expansion i'll be the first person to say okay i'll, I'll help you guys expand in the u.s because their technology is not different from you know venmo and the rest but the difference is that venmo is not really focused a lot on you know, QR code like mm-hmm. China. Um, I think most of their learning is actually not from the US fintech companies, which is shocking, right? Yeah. They're mostly focused on China, M-Pesa, which is uh, from Kenya. Uh, M-Pesa probably was the first really solid, I would say, fintech company that uses mobile technology um, before every other fintech companies actually came to be. Yeah, I think people in the US definitely underestimate the tech talent in Africa. Because every time you look up, Hear about somebody building something crazy, like some young man built a, I don't know, a generator that transforms something off plastic bottles, right? It's just like, what? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Invention, uh, they say necessity is a matter of invention. Yes, yes. And I think we, we're too comfortable right now. Yes. We have everything we need, credit cards we have, debit cards we have, we have, you know, Apple Pay and all this kind of stuff, and we have everything we need. We have self-driving cars now. Um, you could literally go purchase one. Yeah. Uh, but there are other people in this world who are still trying to figure out what they actually need as far as like just improving their lives. And so they find themselves creating some crazy things. Uh, there's some kids like in Ghana and in, in Nigeria that are creating cars out of like this recycled product. Okay. Yeah. I remember hearing you that. See? Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Oh man, that's crazy. I was looking, I'm like, and just a little bit of my story when I was, when I was like 10, 11 until 14, I would say I used to wait, I used to make, car models uh, out of like you know teens and those teens or cans are as big as you know they can carry like one liter mm-hmm. of oil in it and they were donated by the u.s right um and so we would cut it and then i would make cars out of it um i sold those cars and i tried to even make a chopper and and put a put a um a, a cassette a cassette uh, what do you call model in it to like spin it and then make it fly but I didn't know the signs of aviation. So I didn't know that I needed the materials to be lighter. And then I need even more power to, for, you know, for the, for the, for the lift to, to happen. So there's like so many things I haven't learned that I'm learning today. Like I am fascinated by aerospace, but looking at what I had right now, I'm like, wow, I could have literally made a flying plane if I knew this, you know what I mean? Our library was so deficient with information, so. One thing I think a lot of people realize is like how many mobile phones are in like, like the quote unquote, like Africa, Asia, right? Because like, I think the density per capita, there's way more phones in Africa than the United States anywhere else. Yeah, because that's their, that's their, their device of choice mm-hmm. to do all the business that they need to do, right? They there's no time to jump on a computer to make things happen. Mm -hmm. Like you, you're always on the go. And plus you can't carry a computer to, to a tree. So you can get a, uh, what do you call it? A a network reception. (laughs) Yeah. I'll tell you the story. So, um, when, when I was back in Kenya and, uh, uh, what do you call, um, that's when like mobile uh, network was actually pushed Mm -hmm. to the area. It was in the refugee camp and, uh, so basically what happened is that it's like a wave in the evening because there's no so much wind you can have a consistent reliable cell phone network during the day because it's windy and whatever something is affecting the wave right so you you don't get good reception 
um, usually when I have my phone and I see a ring on my phone, like it's ringing, uh, you, Nokia and, and cause mostly it was Nokia and, and Motorola, you'll see this like ringing thing. You're like, oh, somebody's calling me. <laughs> and then now, now what I'm thinking is if I answer this call and the network is to disappear, then I would miss that call. Then that means I'll have to like wait until later and then I have to like ring this person again. It, it, it could be like a whole day thing. Just trying to just have a call with somebody. When you receive that call, there's something that's joy about like, oh my goodness, we have this reception. And then reception goes away and they're like, ah, oh, man, I gotta go jump on a tree. <laughs> like seriously, we jump on a tree or we go to the highest elevation, but to find a higher, higher elevation, you have to walk for like miles. The place is pretty flat. So yeah, man, you always jump on your, on your, on your house. Like that's what most people did, uh, climb on their house. Uh, made of, gotta do what you gotta do, right? Oh my goodness, yeah. Well, talk about uh, Cosmos Innovation. Yeah, so um, with Cosmos Innovation, um, I started it because I wanted to give that experience that I can, right? Um, I wanted to be that person that kind of like, you know, helps people, guide people to build um, their first initial startup or just help them, you know, kind of like distill the information that they have in their mind. I, I literally started because people were asking me, to build them something. I wasn't like there like, oh, let me just start Cosmos Innovation so I can make money. I started literally to just help people. And then from there, people are like, okay, we'll pay you. And then I'm like, cool. Um, then I started to actually take it very seriously. Um, it's you by yourself right now? It's me and other people. So my co-founder was helping me at the time when I, when I started. Um, he's a great designer, by the way. Um, and so I give him to do some of the design work. Then I was not a designer. I was just code and code so and then i learned design from him and i taught myself uh when the first wave of COVID started because i was always outsourcing the designs and i had to wait for results i decided to learn it myself i spent like a month or two learning how to design and i designed a couple of products for a couple of products for my clients and i became a designer so i do design now and i write the code for that design so i know what i am releasing to the world if it doesn't meet the spec of my design, then it's not yet going out. And so that, and then also working with other people that I hired, oh, I hired this uh, one lady, her name is called McKenna and she is really good designer. Um, when I hired her, also remember imposter syndrome was mm -hmm. also a problem. And so I gave her a chance to work with me and, uh, and she was so fabulous. She didn't know how fabulous she was. <laughs> Most people don't. No, and I, I think she should have gotten a, a job at Microsoft and stuff like that. But sometimes these companies are just too, I don't know, what's the word? Yeah, I know what you're saying. You know? How should, what's, how should developers and uh, designers work together? How do they? Yeah, how should they work together? Uh, it depends. Um, so being a product person, because I lead both engineering and product, it's very easy for me. Like I can work with designers who have never seen code before and I'll make them understand what they're doing without even questioning it. Some people don't. They just expect the designer to know what they know. And that's one of the problems plaguing the industry. Designers and engineers don't know how to work together very well. So they have to bring that intermediary person. I think it should be a common skill to have to know how to communicate well with somebody else who is not a, not an engineer. So what does a product person do? So I think the product person really, um, in a sense, is somebody who, you know, kind of like initiates the, the, the direction of the, of the product, like the vision of the product, right? Um, because if there's no one that starts the vision, then what do you build? Nothing. So the product person basically sits down and start to like say, okay, we are going to be building this thing depending on if they're just getting started, but if it's something that's already in place and the product person will say, okay, this is what the product used to do. Um, it's doing well with, you know, this, you know, type of group of people and it's doing well with this type of businesses, you know, small or big or stuff like that. Now we have to figure out ways to add more functionalities that actually, you know, that they were asking or requesting. So how do we do that effectively? So the product person basically comes up with ways to do that. Um, 
and then share that with everybody else, right? Of course, you know, you want to get an input from the engineer if it's possible to build it, right? You want to ask the designer, is this type of design, is it possible to design? Because to be honest, some designs are not easy, right? Like I personally struggle with some designs. I'm like, how is this going to work? I'm loading data and I need to do this type of animation. I have never done this before. So you have to figure out all these nuances. Um, but there's multiple ways what a product person does or what a product person is to other people, right? To me, that's what I see on a daily basis. Talk about how you do your product roadmap. How do I do my product roadmap? Yeah. Um, I really don't have a, a cut defined, I would say, um, strategy for that. Uh, I think I'm still building, I'm working on it. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have 10 years of experience yet, so I don't know if that matters. But <laughs> um, um, what I do is um, I tend to work from top to the bottom as opposed to from the bottom to the top, which is I want to know what the product is, that what, what are we creating, right? Create the vision for it. Um, and then what is this product going to look like? how are people going to interact with this product uh does it have to be you know mobile does it have to be um web only does it have to be you know vr whatever that is right so then basically break down the things that we can do as far as like you know accomplishing our goals right we can start with let's say user logins user registration and then uh some of the like really you know nitty gritty things right and then you go kind of like that way um and then you involve people from the back end and the front end to like work on that piece together right so that every time you're moving on the next piece you're moving you know you're in you're, you're synced basically right so um and then of course i do have a product roadmap as far as like product requirement which is the product roadmap for me um it basically lists out what what we can do what we cannot do um what we should thinking of what we should be thinking of doing if we're to complete some of these uh, requirements and so that way kind of like it builds up the, uh, the expectation but then also it kind of like says okay um there's a there's a room to play with here if we have time to like add this if not um the product is done the goal is to get the product ready right if we can get the product ready that's great minus a couple things here and there the bells and the whistles is what they say so We'll talk about this. So I think sometimes like talk about non-tech founders, like there's sometimes a disconnect in communication, right? Because like example, you ask will say a quote unquote regular person, hey Jason, can you open the door? Jason goes open the door. As a tech person, open the door, you gotta say, hey tech person, stand up a 90 degree angle, use two percent thrust. You know, it has to be like, you know, regular person you say do one, two, three, four, five. Tech person, you gotta say, do one A, one B, one C, one D. Like, how do we fix a disconnect? Is the responsibility of a tech person to solve it, like not tech founder to solve it? Because when I first started doing this list, I was like, here, tech person, do this. Mm -hmm. And like, what is this? Well, you told me to do this. So I know it's not. So it's like, how do we like fix that, so to speak? Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> that thing is, uh, that type of scenario happens all the time. And I think the best way to fix that issue is one, if you're developing a product that is heavily engineering, right? Let's take an example with Elon Musk, right? Elon is a software engineer, right? So it's an advantage for him, um, but he's not an aerospace engineer. He didn't study aerospace. The only way for him to build SpaceX is to actually get into the heads of the engineers, see? So you go the other way around to learn about the mechanics and the, the sciences and the physics and all this kind of stuff to understand how that works. I mean, like he did physics, so that helped him and he knows a lot about other things. But for every other regular person who's building just a normal, regular software, um, one, you don't have to be a software expert. That's one thing, right? Don't become a software expert. But understand the lingo that they use, uh, but not in details. Like if somebody's asking for you to design a button, right? You're like, well, you're asking a, a, a developer to create a button for you. You would say, hey, I would like to create a button in um, on the top of the, uh, what do you call, um, on top of the, um, the website or whatever it is. Um, I wanted on the left, right, uh, maybe put a 20, you know, 20 pixel, you know, padding. Um, the color could be, you know, could be red because that's the theme that we are running with. 
um, and that will give that person, the engineer, the developer, what to play with. But if you just say, hey, I want a button. Okay, you want a button. I can slap a button there, but would that button really do what it's supposed to do? What is the button supposed to do, right? So you basically give that detail. So you break every problem with a, every problem is a story. And within that story, you create the task out of it. That's called, I think, what, storyboarding, I think? Yeah, storyboarding. Yeah. yeah. So you have to do that, right? Um, there's other things like people use in Scrum that I don't remember because that's like so like corporate thing. <laughs> and I remember when I was doing that, I was just like, uh, epic uh, story yeah. and what, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's, it's a story and it's just basically breaking down those tasks to, to get whatever needs to be, to be handled. And you have to attach every asset that is needed to get it done. So that way the engineer really focuses on just building. You don't want the engineer to focus on cropping your image, right? That's not what they do. You give that to a designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I know what, what a platform I'm building. After I say I want something and my tech co-founder always send back, Jason, more detail, like crap, you yeah. know? That's, yeah. that's a code word. We send more details. Okay, let me go back and like be more detailed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So detail is really, is really huge. C could you, could you, elab could you share with us a little bit about, you know, when you started building your own product, right? You, you had the idea and you were just thinking, okay, maybe I need to find somebody who knows how to build software and yeah. stuff like that. And then I can work with them. But like, what are some, like, what are some of the pitfalls or what are some of the learning curve oh, or man. some of the things that I've you been through so many tech people. Like first I got some, some interns. They say this, we built the site, nothing I really wanted. They had a really good CTO out of the Air Force. Well, he left, he, has, he had a job at, at Space Camp, you know, had another good CTO. He left for a better paying job. Mm -hmm. it, it's been a struggle. Have people like, come, people like kind of ripped me off. Some people like didn't perform well. I mean, it's a challenge, right? I mean, this is, cause like, it's bad to say a lot of tech people are not as good as they think they are, right? They're not good. And it's a matter of like, now we're going to the coding academies, like a, what's called co-fellows, different coding academies, finding people. And people want to graduate and want like $200,000 a year. Like what? I can afford $200,000 a year, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's been a struggle, right? And of course you got to learn the lingo. Like I would ask myself, if I'm back in time, I said I learned to code myself. Mm -hmm. I don't know, probably not, you know, cause like do I don't have the time for it, you know, probably not, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not easy, right? Like I mean, that's the reason why, but like you said, like people like you, Elon Musk, tech people have an advantage, right? Because they can build a product, right? Yeah. Like in my mind, where I'm at right now, I should be like, I'm like a year and a half behind, right? Because all the other tech stuff I've been through, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? It is, it is a challenge. And I, I totally feel how you, you know. Um, and it's frustrating too, right? Because you know your mind, because you validate the idea, people want to buy it. I mean, like my market, like way up here, right? Yeah. But then I really can't, I do better testing and something breaks, you know, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. And also, he's, he's, he's one good thing that you have is the marketing part. Mm -hmm. I think if you want to build anything successful, you got to know how to sell. Yeah. And that's one thing that, I would say Elon Musk doesn't know how to sell, but I think he has learned how to sell yeah. over time, right? And I think personally, I don't even know how to sell. I don't even know what are the psychology for mm -hmm. being a good salesperson. I think you either have it or you don't have yeah. it, right? And um, I think I probably have a bit of an ounce of like being, you know, a salesperson. Like I can sell things when I believe in what I'm building, right? If you're giving me a tire to sell, and you, you're telling me this tire, I can drive my car on the water and it will be fine. My car wouldn't sink. I would ask questions. Yeah. What kind of tire is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I have to know what kind of tire it is. So um, you, you're right. Um, definitely, you know, if you're building a product and you're not familiar with the landscape, you're definitely going to find yourself digging multiple holes before you find the right hole. And in this case, you know, going to multiple places, um, I was at Code Fellow as a mentor and um, I've mentored a couple of people. And, you know, the fact is that, remember we talked about when you go to a boot camp or you go to college, you can, you know, it doesn't matter, right? And again, it's up to the individual. I've seen people that actually put it in the work at the boot camps. You can find the very rare, right? And that's why, Becoming a software engineer is very rare too, right? Like it's like one of the skills that where you either focus really building product or you really focus about everything else. And that's what most of everybody is, focus on everything else, right? And so when you find somebody that is focused on that, be it in college, be it at, at bootcamp, 
you would see that they did a really good job and they only find one or two of those people. And I, when I was mentoring, I was seeing that. I was seeing, you know, two or three people. I, I even hired one person from there because he was so good. I'm like, I got to hire this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he knows things. Just talking to him, he knows it. I just got him hired. Um, I tried to get a couple of people hired, uh, but um, <clears throat> I don't think it went through as, 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 as far as I, I'm concerned. Oh, unknown whatever um i don't know what, the, what word to use <laughs> but um I've, I've i've done my best to like get some people hired from that place um as, as a as a tech founder you know you going through that process of like figuring out the right co-founder who's a tech uh technical person or finding the right place to build a product and that's one thing that i'm trying to answer myself right there's those people out there that are that have these issues and when they come to me or to us, I'll just use us because I don't want to single myself always um, because I bring some people when I feel like they need, it needs to happen. Um, we basically, we promise them a, an MVP. I think an MVP is probably more important than trying to build a whole product. Like what is it that Jason really want to accomplish? Can we get this Jason in the next six months, right? If we can, then we deliver that, right? And that way then Jason focuses on how to market this business, focus on, okay, maybe what are some of the things that I need to be building to uh, make this product successful if or when it's ready, right? And so that's what I do with most of the entrepreneurs that I'm working with. Um, transparent conversation. If there's an issue, I'm gonna tell you the issue. There's really no need for me to not tell you the issue because if I don't, it's gonna hurt you right? Uh, you might end up giving it to somebody like, okay, look, this is what we have. Now, one thing that non-technical people do, um, it's very, it's very small amount of number, is they'll find somebody else to build a product for them. And then those people will try to rebuild everything from scratch. There's always something that's salvageable in software. You don't have to, unless or otherwise, this product is like really terrible. Yeah, I've heard of that a lot, you know. Yeah, if it's really terrible, <laughs> it's fine, like build it from scratch. Um, but in the most sense, um, I, you know, if I were to talk to everybody else who is non-technical, is to say that fish carefully, fish for the right talent, um, that will save you a lot of headache. Yeah, because some options, you go to Upwork, Fiverr, you know, local academies, like, but, I mean, somebody might be on, on the Upwork and charge $100 an hour, but they're actually ripping you off. And someone only charged $20, might be a good person. It's like, all the outsource in India, Mexico, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's because you, you don't know what they do. I mean, like, you, are you gonna look at a GitHub and look at the code? Probably not, right? No, no. <laughs> it's, it's craziness. Yeah, it's just a lot of craziness out there. But uh, yeah, so that's what mostly we focus on at Casmos Innovation. Our goal is to simplify this process. Um, and also the other part that is really good about what we do is if we find that we can do what you ask for, if you want a VR, we are not a VR focused company. We'll send you to a VR company. I'm not a Web3 focused guy, right? Because my goal is to build a general product, right? If you want like very niche stuff, um, like building a complete DeFi from the ground up, I wouldn't be the right person. I've tried doing that before and I realized I should give it to somebody else who knows how to do it. And so, and then I can look into my contacts. Well, the people that I can send to you that can help you build it. So let's we'll talk about this. And this is my opinion. It's like a lot of developers, they're always building something, right? They have all these products built and building, but they rarely complete anything, right? Can you talk about that? Yeah, that happens. And uh, I have, unfortunately, I have not had that issue. Um, I have tried to, because it's like, for me, like it's like dignity and integrity kind, of, integrity kind of thing, where like if I start something, I have to just get it done. Like I cannot just leave it halfway and then go to another thing and then leave it halfway and then go to another, leave it halfway, right? Um, and as I'm building like two products at the same time, I am communicating results at the same time as well. If I'm not working on this product for a week, that means whatever I'm working on here has a dependency that I'm gonna use here. So every time I'm working on something, there's dependency. Every time I'm working on something, there's dependency. If there's no dependencies, I am not taking that project. And I think, Yes, that's a problem out there. I can't speak for everybody else, but um, 
I think it becomes an issue. Like I have started back then when I, you know, started to work on products, I would find myself, um, you know, I will have a really good idea. Um, but then as I'm doing the market research, I realized that there's a, a really good product out there that's very similar. And I think, why do I want to create this anyways? So and then th those are the kind of things that I leave undone mm -hmm. because I just don't see any need for it right now. Um, but after like one year, if I still see what is there not improving, then I would go back to my shelf. I'm like, okay, I think now we can work on this product, right? So that's the kind of like mentality I have. I don't create multiple things that just not going to help me. So um. I don't know if I answered your question. You, you did. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing your GitHub is pretty, pretty huge. It is growing. I would say that um, it's, you know, I, this, this, so in my GitHub, there's personal and then there's the company one. And the company one is where people contribute to. And the personal one is just mine contributing on it. So on your GitHub, like what kind of fun stuff are you working on right now? Just to be. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you, but it's this mostly client project right okay. now. Um, and so. One of them we're about to release very soon. I think it's almost done right now. Um, I say almost done for the last month because it was almost done, <laughs> but I think it's actually done uh, because, you know, I got sick and then moved the date a little bit yeah. and then I got some things happening and then, you know, my child was sick for a bit. And so there's like so many things that happen at the same time and, and it just kind of like continues to, and then there's blockers, right? Yeah. Um, Right now, I don't think there's anything super interesting that I can share. Um, okay. Other than just, um, I'm trying to work on this new solution that I'm still figuring out, and I'm trying to use Rust because mm -hmm. um, Rust is the new savior, the new sexy logo, new sexy language, so to speak. Se yeah, exactly. People, everybody's like talking about Rust, and I'm like sitting there. So I learned Rust in like a week, and then I'm like, okay, I understand Rust. But this, and then I realized this just because like, you know, like with programming languages, you can learn programming languages and then, and then you start building something and then you're like, okay, now how do I do these other things that deals with the, you know, the, the low level, like, you know, mutex and, you know, race conditions and those kind of stuff. And then you try to learn how to do that in those languages. You're like, oh, this is so foreign. Um, and Rust looks very foreign, but once you really get comfortable with it, oh my goodness. The code looks beautiful. I don't know why I'm saying that, but it does look beautiful. Um, but it it actually, the good thing, okay, so I'll tell you one thing about it, is that when you write something in a different way, it will tell you that you can improve this code this way. And then you just select it, and then it just does that for you. And then I look at that, I'm like, whoa. That's crazy. Yeah, that's like, I'm like, okay, this is like. That's, that's like next level. Oh my goodness. This is like the 22nd century programming languages a uh, language that definitely is going to rival c plus plus and, and c c and c plus plus are not memory safe um it can be hacked um that one is memory safe so if Rust going to become your go-to it is about to is it? yeah because i'm just like i i've i've met this uh, one guy who is building a, a an electric car so actually the reason why I'm doing it is because I want to build an electric car. <laughs> so it's like, he showed me, it's like, okay, this is, this is what he's going to be doing. And I'm like, okay, cool. You're going to be building an electric car. I've been thinking about this in a long time. Um, if I don't build an electric car, maybe I'll work for another new startup that is building an electric car. And then I'll write the brain of that, uh, what do you call computer. So I'm basically learning how to build CPU, no CPU, um, always from the ground up using, using Rust, but I have not gotten anywhere far away. Just to be clear. But I have done one thing, which is cool. I have actually two things. I made an LED function, so that was good. So embedded system. And then I built a, a small, usually it would be like a class project where you ask somebody to put input something and then you do something. And I find it really fascinating because the way I built it and the way I was like building it, it was different from everything I've built before. It just felt like, I felt like I was just born to do it, even if I wasn't like, you know, no one is born to write software, you know, but it just felt so good. It felt natural. So it's very exciting. So you talk about diversity in tech earlier and like, you know, we both been involved in tech for a few years and you know, those always talk about it, performance measures, but it doesn't like the stats ever get better. Like the stats are just saying like same number of, you no know, people color and, you know, on a board of advisors or people get funding. Like, how do we go from like, just talking about X, you know, 
doing something about it. Yeah, I mean, just do something about it. Like, it's literally the answer to everything. I think, um, you know, we talk about like where people come from as far as like class and stuff like that. And I think this idea of classism is definitely killing everything, to be honest. Um, but imagine if people were to live on a, in a, in a situation where like everybody, everybody contributes to the same system equally. I don't know. That's that's just in a in, in a utopia world. But in a place where everybody is having access to information the same way everybody does. Like you have access to information regardless. The government is always there supporting all businesses because if the government does that, then the society or the citizens are always going to be what? Functional. They are always going to be productive. And that's what adds to the GDP of the country, right? I think the government needs to do that first themselves. I think the government is not as diverse as it is. That's first. If you can't, in the highest of the office, have that diversity, what do you expect private companies to do, right? It's like it's like in everyone's face. Like you see it everywhere. Like they have to start from there. And I think Biden, uh, Biden's uh, what do you call choice of like you know uh, electing uh, Katanji as the Supreme Court um, person. I don't know. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, close enough. Yeah, close enough. Yeah, um, I think is 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 definitely pivotal for how everybody looks um, at the highest office. Because if you see that it's happening, then you're like, wow, there is people that are qualified out there that we can hire. We just got to cast the net as wide as we can. Like, that's all we got to do. I don't want to to like, it gets me sometimes. Like, a lot of people say we're going to do reverse hiring. Well, it's not easy to do reverse hiring, right? Because first of all, they have to be qualified. You got to find them, right? And just because you can't say, hey, you know, Hispanic female come work for me. No, you can't you, say that. You, yeah. I mean, you got to be able to throw a reason to come work for you, right? And, yeah. then you, and if you mess around, like hire, like, I'm going I'm to change it up. Instead mm -hmm. of 10 white guys, if you have like coming with 10 white females mm -hmm. and you will go hire like a Hispanic female, what, why should you go work for you, right? Because mm -hmm. the culture is not for her, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cultural is, is definitely something big. I think, I think companies, so business to me is business. But also when, when you say business is business without giving that human element to it, because business is a breathing organism, to be honest. Because without people, that business wouldn't breathe. Right, and if you want this this business to breathe on a larger scale, you have to think about who is going to be out there breathing the same air. Right, so that's what business is, and I think people have to start thinking of business as, you know, as that. And 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 once we do that, when we cast the net, um, we are not going in there with a propaganda like, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like a lot of people do that. Oh my goodness everywhere right like my there's no propaganda like when we mean to when we mean to like bring a diverse um uh, build a diverse organization we mean to build that that's like our focus right that's what we're going to be doing and we are going to increase programs where there are no programs um if you, you know like places that have no good schools how can we increase new programs there because you know, you cannot find, I would say this, in order to find the right skills, you can, you wouldn't go to my age set that you're gonna find the skills that you want for your organization. You have to build it up. And most people don't have that build up. So if you help them build up the situation in their communities, right? You have a high chances of finding those right talents everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer you need to hire the best person, however comma, the best person can be in many, many places, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, what's your take on the um, current Seattle tech scene? Yeah, it's pretty big. I mean, like, which, which part do you want me to take? Like, is a, is, a, is a place for opportunity? Well, let me go, maybe backtrack. Um, let's do this. So, you know, there's like, the, who's, who should be doing what, right? Suppose there's like the, the tech scene in Seattle, right? They're trying to do reverse hires. So they go where the diverse talent is, or should the diverse talent go where the tech people are at? I think it's equally. It's, I think, a tech and receive kind of thing. I think, um, so one, 
it's good to understand that there is a problem that already exists, right? That's very important. And then two, what are some of the measures we have uh, that we that we're gonna put in place that can help elevate those you know issues and and make them you know more prominent in the company, right? And also in the community as well. And also, I think third, I think it would be important for this organization to show their faces in whatever communities that they want to hire, right? Um, and again, just like how they've been doing with multiple, you know, for the last century, last, not century, like last decade since, you know, the, you know, that kind of bubble um, is to find people from schools, like elite schools, that's what they did in most other colleges. Uh, but also you find in those colleges, there were very few represented uh, minorities in there, right? So the number dwindles all the time. But if you go to boot camp, if you go to other places, unconventional places to find those talents, you will find those talents. So I think it's paramount that they look for other avenues as opposed to just that one avenue that always filters, right? All the filters, like majority, you know, white dudes that have the opportunity, they have seen everything as far as like, you know, tech and all this kind of stuff because it's been always in their face, right? And then you have those who have, you know, you know, Latino, you know, African American, and everyone else that haven't seen that. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you find a way to inclusively not feel like you are? Let, let's put it this way. Like you said earlier, you can't say, "Oh, I'm looking for Hispanic. I'm look, I'm looking for an African American." Right? You can say we're looking to hire diverse talents. Yes. And that could be everybody. Yeah, I mean, diverse is, is everything, right? I mean, exactly. That's what diverse means. I'm looking to hire diverse talent. So a lot, a lot of people think when you, when you say I'm hire diverse, they think you only mean like black, Hispanic. Diverse can be like, you know, a white guy over 40 who's a military veteran. It could mean like a high school student. It could mean anything. Yeah, it could, it could mean anything. And and also he's 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 one that's you you to the money. Um when organizations say diverse and people are like, wait, you're talking about diversity and I don't see any diversity, right? Um, well, there's diversity of that. And then there's a diversity of humans and cultures. I think it would be diversity of cultures that would make sense. Because if you do diversity of cultures, then you have multiple cultures represented, right? Yeah. Because if yes. you say diversity, then it could be, you know, like you just said earlier, um, and then the people that are going to apply, they will look at the mission statement and they will look at the makeup of the, com of the company and they're like, there's no diversity here because people are so stuck on what diversity means and how diversity is translated. Uh, I mean, personally, I would say that, <laughs> um, you know, diversity in thought is definitely great diversity in, you know. Um, and so many people get mad when you say diversity of thought for some reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like... Um, I don't know how to say this. I think it's it's there's different diversity of thoughts, but here's what's really interesting. You can really you can really experience diversity in thoughts if you have diversity in cultures. Yes, yeah. You know what I mean? Like <clears throat> if you want to sell to the African American community or to the other parts of the world, which make up the large majority of the population of the world, you have to know something about those cultures, right? And how do you do that? You have to find those people who are from those areas in order to bring that ethos. Is that the right word? Yeah. Um, yes. Into the uh, what do you call into the uh, uh, organization, and 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 therefore it basically represents with the organization itself. So I got two good examples. One, this happened a couple years ago. There's some company in Canada. They won like diversity award, right? Mm -hmm. But everyone was white, so they were like clapping back. Where's the diversity? Where's the diversity at? This is those BS. Yeah, yeah. And one of the people would like clap back and said, no. We're actually like, there's like six, seven, three of us are immigrants, two of us are LGBTQ, mm -hmm. one of us like, you know, handicapped, and they broke into one, and, and like all of them had all the different diversity, right? We don't have the diversity you think about, we're actually diverse, right? Yeah. And another example was these uh, three African-American men, they graduated from, I think, from law school or whatever, mm -hmm. or say from Howard, and some of them put like, what a great picture of diversity. And people are like, uh, they're all the same, how's that diverse, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, no, I, 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 tell, I, yeah, I think, I think, I think just the word diversity, just throwing it around. So too many people throw it around. Yeah, yeah. To me, like sometimes I sit down, like I've always questioned what diversity really means. 
right? And like I said earlier, it could be culture. It could be uh, most of like the biggest umbrella for it is culture. Yeah, like that's the biggest umbrella. You cannot take that away, right? Um, but everything, everything else also, you know, lies under diversity mm-hmm. too, right? Um, somebody from the military, right? Um, somebody who is from Wall Street, right? That's diversity, right? Somebody who is, you know, like what you know, immigrant. I don't know, like this, this all this stuff, like that can make a diversity. I think, I think what people want to need to do is, is the mission statement should be cultural diversity for humans or something like that, or human cultural. I'm gonna, to, I'm gonna have to steal that from you like that. Something like that, because that way then you are actually representing humans, cultural cultures. I think a lot of people do wrong too. Is like they'll say they're for diversity, right? But in reality, they're like pro their group, right? Whether it be pro Hispanic, pro Asian, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you're not diverse, right? No. Oh, and they're pro immigrant, pro refugee. That's fine, and Danny be pro whatever, but it's not diverse. No, that's very correct, and you know. The reason why I'm able to communicate with multiple people of different places or even different cultures is one, I'm not singling people out. Like I'm not just looking like, okay, this is this is the Western culture, this is the African culture, this is the Chinese culture, this is the Japanese culture. I'm trying to understand all of it and I'm trying to communicate with that communities. You know what I mean? Like the re- it allows allows for information to flow without friction because the moment I start to silo my thoughts that I need a diversity, but then I'm like, okay, diversity is just for African-American, diversity for African-Americans where they can be African, they, they can be like people from Caribbean, uh, people from um, Africa, people from, you know, London, uh, people from, you know, I don't know say London, but Europe, <laughs> uh, you know, people from, you know, all these places that can make a diverse, you know. They all have their different cultures. They have different cultures. And, but this one thing, if there's anything about this group is the thought is not different. Mm-hmm. It's not different. Like people think the same, especially from cultures that you put together, right? And if, if you have a culture where everybody's thinking the same, then you don't have diversity because that thinking in itself, because of cultural background, kind of like erases the diversity meaning out of that organization. Yeah, I yeah. agree. So, so Tavon, talk about how you're impacting the world through tech. Yeah, um, I think I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I think for the most for the most part, I think um, I'm just sharing a lot about tech, just kind of like bring people closer with tech, um, make, you know, some things known, you know, as far as like what's going on in tech, because you know, not so many people really understand so much of the thing that's going on that could change their lives or in a better way, in a good way or in a bad way. Um, but I think just also just inspiring, you know, refugees who are, you know, who came to this country and looking to join tech and have no idea like how to do that. Um, I think that's, that to me is very important. But my, over, my like my, like, if there's anything that I could do, like if I want to spend my time um, doing it really well, I mean, everything else philanthropy wise is great, but I would love to dedicate, you know, a, a specific amount of my resources to build the next generation of tech um, in Sudan and Kenya and all those places around the world and even the United States, because still I live in the United States, right? So there's, there's so many places that still need that help. And I think creating a, so I'll, I'll tell you this, my plan is really to do something really interesting. I'm trying to create sort of like a school university type kind of thing, uh, but it is really focused on learning on the move kind of thing, right? Come in, learn as much as you can, but focus on one specific thing that you're really good at, like do it. And then go out there and 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 fix the, the problems that you find. Sorry, let me just pop my finger. No <laughs> um, and 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 find things that you want to work on because that way then you can see direct impact. My goal is to like see. I don't want people to spend like four years in college and then realize that they could have done that a long time ago. 
like I want to realize as soon as you get in, like what is one thing that is in your mind that you can solve? If I was to give you the resources, what is it, right? And I think the places, especially the places that I came from, um, there's so many problems that can solve for themselves that just need that little bit of push. Like, you know, here's a facility for you. Here is resources that you could use. Um, you know, just go solve that problem. And I think you would attract the right talents because if you tell somebody we have $100,000 to change, to build light bulb that, um, that is a made of, that is a firefly. I don't know why I say firefly, but a firefly light bulb that just flies around like a drone or something. I don't really don't know. I'm just making this up. But is that a problem that you want to solve? If it is, then come solve it. Maybe there's application for many things once you build that, right? Um, what about, you know, electricity? Do we need to build some, you know, more dams or do, you need, do we need to build more uh, solar, you know, farms and stuff like that? If you can create even 10 to solve a problem, um, it's, not, it's an opportunity for you. So I think creating that type of uh, apprenticeship type of opportunity, I think, is what the world needs. Um, going to school is great, but I think that's for other people. Some people just want to solve the problem right now. I'm just given that opportunity. I remember, uh, do you know what TAF is? No. So it's, a, it's not a credit away. It's like Technology Access Foundation. That's a, that's a volunteer to write. And, and then it's eighth grade, like they're like science, stuff like that, computer science. Yeah. And this one person had an idea, well, basically like take your phone mm -hmm. and use like electricity from your body to charge a phone. Ooh. I'm like, whoa. Like if I had a billion dollars, I'd give it to you right now, right? Oh my goodness. So it's like, this, this stuff like blew me away, right? The stuff they're trying to do, you know, like who would have thought about it? Charge your phone to your electricity out of your body, right? No, you have energy, you know that. Yeah. And that kinetic energy can be used, whatever that energy is. I don't think it's kinetic necessarily, but there's some kind of energy. Yeah. Do you know that there was, there were watches back in the day that uses our blood to function? I've heard of that, yeah. My dad had one of that, yeah. I think. I don't know where it is. I mean, He's passed away a long mm. time ago, but there was a watch where as soon as he takes it off mm. from his hand, mm. it stops working. Mm. He puts it on and it's working. Or probably I saw it with somebody else. My memory is just so jacked up. Right now. <laughs> but I've seen it. Oh, it's crazy. So define underrepresentation from your point of view. What does that mean? So underrepresentation uh, from my point of view is... I don't, I won't talk from the high level because at high level, you have to come from, you have to start from somewhere before you come up here. And I think um, underrepresentation starts from colleges, from, uh, from schools, I would say that. Um, there's so many, like, okay, I'll tell you an example. When I went for the computer science degree thing, I think people are discouraged. Like they get discouraged very easily because there's one thing that people say about computer science that it's not for everybody. And that when you're in there, imagine coming from a society where you, you just don't think you're good enough, right? Because that's what you kind of like grew up seeing. Like, I'm not good enough. I don't belong in that office. I don't, I can't own that car unless I do, you know, drugs, or unless I, you know, sell people. Like, like weird things that people grew up seeing. Like that's everyone, like, like most, you know, um, I would say, you know, 25% of the, the world are living in a way where like, they don't really know if they can do it or not. Now, example is just United States in itself, right? So the people that don't know how to, um, and um, by the way, people shouldn't sell people, shouldn't sell drugs. So that's not a good way to make money. Um, uh, it's bad. So, but if you have people that are really disadvantaged at that capacity, it's really hard to find a representation at, a senior level because only very few of those people that have the mindset I have or even better end up in these positions, right? And so, so basically what needs to be done really for underrepresentation, I would say it's at the core of the next generation that we, we cultivate. I think that's where the underrepresentation is happening and not having enough of cultural representation in an organization that is definitely underrepresentation um, in many sense. So what, what, what tech excites you right now? What new tech out there excites you? 
what new tech excites me? I think I still AI excites me. Um, the intersectionality between AI and blockchain, I think is gonna be huge. And I have not seen it being touched yet because right now we are at the point where we're collecting data. So once we collect data, then AI needs to start doing some work on this blockchain stuff. So with AI, you think, you think AI is gonna take over the world or robots are gonna rule everything? Yeah. Humans are always going to rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's AI, AI is always going to be there, but it, the reality is humans are always going to rule the world. It's like, there's really no way we can allow a foreign, you know, not foreign, but things that we build to control us. Like, that's not going to happen. Um, if 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 Jason thinks it's it's a good thing, uh, somebody else is going to say, Jason, you're wrong. Yeah, They will come and destroy it before you even know it, right? So somebody's always... As you're planning something, someone is always ahead of you. Or if that person is ahead of you, someone is always ahead of them, right? So um, AI is great. It's not going to take over the world, but it is going to, in some sort, take over some parts of the world, not all over the world, because majority of the world don't even, are not even on the internet. But that, it's crazy, right? People, in the, we don't realize how, how much the world is not on the internet. Mm -hmm. And actually, how many, how many people in the world like, live off a dollar a day or don't have clean water? Like, we don't realize that. We're it, so mm -hmm. sheltered. Oh yeah, there's just so many issues. There's homelessness. Or, there's homelessness already in this in Seattle itself. It's there's so many problems to be solved. And if we let AI take over, maybe AI will clean up the bad guys and then say, "Hey, are you the good guy? Let's let's figure out a way to work together." You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I I hope it doesn't end up like that because that would be terrible for everybody, right? Yeah. No. no, no. <laughs> Here's a question for you. Yeah. Um, I, I saw this on our discussion a while ago. Yeah. Let's suppose like, you know, they have people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all the people we know, Peter Thiel and all these rich people, all the people like pretty much run the world, right? Yeah. So the question was, let's suppose everyone lost everything, right? Uh -huh. Everyone's equal mm -hmm. and everyone in the world was given $25,000. Yeah. Will the top dog now still be the top dogs or will somebody else come on top? Once you give your answer, I'm gonna tell you what, that, what everyone said, what the percentage was. So basically with Elon Musk, if Bezos, the people, would they still be successful and, you know, do what they're doing? Or would someone from unknown place come 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 around? So um, yes and no. Um, I think somebody from other place are gonna probably dominate. But the reason why I say yes and no is that one, if you have the resources already in place, you're already ahead of everything. So everything's equal. There's no resources. Everyone just gets twenty five thousand dollars. Oh oh yeah. If if there's none, um, no. Uh, it, like people from other places will be on the top for sure. Like, because here's the thing, if you have the access at the, so let's say we're getting $25, right? Mm -hmm. And you get the $25 before I get my $25. And at that time, you are lucky to fall, uh, to have discovered something of value. Mm -hmm. And then you capitalize on that. Chances are you're gonna do it better than I am once I get my $25. Mm -hmm. And that, happens all over the world right now the difference so remember it's just money the only thing that is missing is information if information was equally distributed then the chances of somebody from a different place to come to the top is more likely even if the money comes later so interesting so in this poll 80 percent said jay bezos and then we're still get on top yeah, they said like some people might make it, but they say they say because you know because the drive they have, you know, the the mentality that the same people would be successful. Yeah, I mean, okay, so they can be successful, mm -hmm. but the equilibrium will be different. Mm -hmm. Like there will be other people that will be also doing the same thing. I'm I'm, I'm sure when Jeff Bezos started Amazon.com, somebody was already thinking about starting. Oh, yeah, Amazon yeah, no doubt. But they didn't have that twenty five dollars. Jeff Bezos had the twenty five dollars. Yeah. And Jeff Bezos also had well, the skills. Well, actually, he had the $300,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's say that, right? But he also had the information that he knows people are going to want mm -hmm. to get books delivered. So he already made his, his research. Um, he's worked at a financial institution. Yeah. So he knows about money. Now, if you know about money, that's information. Yeah. If you know about how the market works as far as like just, you know, uh, transaction, that's money. That's that's irrelevant. That's relevant. And then the dot com boom. Yeah, I Man. mean, it was a perfect storm for him. Oh, no doubt. Perfect, perfect. It's. I think it's where where the word where the saying 
that says that success is when luck meets opportunity yeah, or something. Yeah. That is basically what it is. But I mean, people could be right. I would say not 80%. I would say probably like 60%. 60%. Yeah, probably mine will be 60%. I mean, like if I had the money and I had the information in 2010, I will be a billionaire by today. I'm not even lying. The reason why I'm saying this is because I'm not even trying to brag here. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because when mobiles are being developed, uh, when mobiles are becoming smarter, I was talking to people in the senior position. Why can I just say hello to the phone and the phone respond back to me? People, some people say that, oh, the, the phone will, will consume battery, will do it. I'm like, no, 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 there's a way to build it. Imagine if I had the money to focus on how to build that, I would license that to everybody. So, Bon, what does the average person get wrong about tech? Uh, what is the average thing that people get about? Like that, uh, man, that's a good one. I have to think about it a little. Okay. You know, most people just put, turn the phone, they think everything works completely right. I don't think they realize how complicated what all the work goes into, like having the phones and all the tech we have. Oh, my goodness. The, yeah, so I'll give you a couple. One, the thing that a developer can fix a phone. Oh, a developer can fix anything that's electrically, you know, malfunctioned. That's one thing about people that think about tech people. So that's not really what people think about tech. Now, if you think about tech in general, right, like how things work, right? Like how this information is being encoded into your computer and then you're receiving it there and then you have this software that like, make gives it life right because software gives it life like this is just waves that are going through and so what happens here is that there's so many um i'll say mechanisms that are being that are working together in order to create this like full experience and that's with software you have multiple services that are listening to this that are listening to that you know like uh, is this person paying is this person um has this person already booked um has this flight, is this flight full? Um, is, is this, um, uh, what do you call, file? Does it have virus, right? There's like multiple components that are working together. And that, you, I can never explain that one to one person and they'll be able to understand that. Impossible. So what got you involved in tech? Say again? What, what, got, what, what got you involved in tech? What got me involved in tech? Um, so um, when I was growing up, I, uh, I, I started to like build, um, not build, but fix electronics. And this when you were in Sudan? No, that was, I was in Kenya. Kenya. Okay. Remember I came from Sudan when I was like four years old. Okay. So I grew up in Kenya my whole okay. life. Right. Until, until I came here, uh, which of which I already finished growing. So, um, <laughs> I worked, uh, on radio pieces that where people had, um, I remember a specific example of something I tell people all the time. This guy had this like radio laying on the corner, uh, the corner of his house. And um, I came in as a kid, like around 10, 11, something like that. And I saw it. I asked him like, hey, can I, can I have that piece of scrappy radio with me? It's like, no, nah, it doesn't work. I'm going to throw it away. You don't want something that doesn't work. I'm like, but yeah, that's the reason why I'm asking. Because instead of you throwing it away, give it to me, please. So he's like, all right, you can take it. So I took that. I spent a month. Remember, I didn't have a book to read what circuits were, what kind of transistors this thing use, what kind of, so many things that I, I know right now that I didn't know it then. So anyways, I basically took it apart and um, built it, you know, back um, by testing. Somehow, I learned And you're like, you see a 10? Yeah. And then I'm just like testing it around. And I'm like, okay. So, I'm, I, and I took the battery. So I basically took one of the wires for the battery. So um, basically connected the, let's say the, um, the positive, you know, the negative side of the battery at where it needs to be. And then the other part, I basically held it without connecting directly. And then I just went into the radio just doing this, right? Like just checking to see um, in the circuit, like seeing what, if, if there's any responses, is there any power that's gonna go through that can cause something, some light or something would happen and something happened. Uh, some light showed and as the light showed I had to figure out the sound and then I went and the sound was up and so it was just doing shh I'm like this is so cool <laughs> in two months I'm like 
I'm able to make this thing resurrect. I didn't ask anyone questions. Now, mind you, I didn't just have that knowledge to do that. I was watching somebody who was fixing radios. I probably asked questions. I don't remember. But all I know is I was just observing. Like, I'm a good observer. And then after I finish observing, I'm going to go do it myself. So that's how I do things, right? And so, um, I, and, and then I had it work. And then uh, I forgot the name of this. Uh, it's like the it's like the station uh, frequency receiver. And so I went to the frequency receiver. I just probably made that name up, but, but maybe it's not the actual name. But anyways, I went just tuned the, the frequencies for the, for the AM station. And voila, a sound came, somebody was talking. And that's, that was it. Like I was hooked, man. Like I was fixing, I was fixing radios. I was fixing watches. I got somebody to come to the cam to help me fix more stuff so that I can split the profits with him. But I mostly made him take the money because he's an older gentleman. He needs the money. I didn't need the money. Um, but at that age, I was already making money. Like I was, I was fixing things. I could see the value. I got interested in tech after I saw Windows 98. And I'm like, wow, this is even more better. It's much better than the, um, than the radios I was fixing. There was something on the screen and you could do something and it's just like really cool. Mind you, I, when I saw a computer, I was like 18 and I was learning how to type, but I still want to learn how to do things on the computer, but no one knew how to do it there. So they only show people how to type and print things. And that was like the only thing that we're taught. So when I came here, that's when I decided, you know what, I want to learn more about this computer stuff. And I heard about Bill Gates. I'm like, that's even better <laughs> because I'm in, in Seattle. This is where Bill Gates is. Um, yeah. So from there on, I just started to continue. And so you, you went from Sudan to Kenya as a refugee? Yeah. So we had war in Sudan and that war has been our whole life. <laughs> it's, it's still going on, isn't it? Uh, it's no peace, I would say. Yeah. But the war... it, it was Sudan. I was like Sudan and South Sudan now, I think. Yeah, it is now split into two. So there was Sudan, the Sudan, the whole thing that was colonized by the British and then the Egyptians and whatnot. Um, and then Sudan got its independence in 1953. And then um, there's the first war called the Anyanya War. Um, and that basically started a whole revolution. Um, and so the, 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 the South has been fighting the North. The North. I think the North was mo <laughs> mostly like bombarding the, the South, I think at that time, that's how I knew the story. Um, but I don't know if that's exactly what was happening, but I think that was what's happening. Um, but then, um, yeah, so we ended up moving out from, from South Sudan. I mean, then I was born in Juba and then we ended up, you know, in Khartoum, which is more peaceful because the south is where it's the bomb is being dropped, right? I mean, there's a relatively peaceful places, but there's still bombs, there's, there's rebels, there's all, it's just like messed up, right? And so, and what were, what were they fighting over this land or this politics, this BS? To be honest, back then I did not understand what mm -hmm. it was, but I think I know now. Um, I think it was because of uh, resources. Okay. Yeah. So, South Sudan right now has so many resources that north i think needs uh the oil is primarily like half of it is located in the south um and so but they were extracting the oil they were using it and remember the people of the north were probably there was a propaganda that was going on mm -hmm. and so they didn't even know what exactly was going on and remember south sudan produces enough oil that its people could use but this oil issue is always like the oil gets processed out, taken away, and then processed and then brought back. Like there's no refinery there. So all the crude oil just, you know, gets shipped away. And then the leaders are just getting richer and richer. Like it's only concentrated in the hands of very few people. And so, you know, when they when South Sudan decided to like, you know, de facto from, from them, um, the people of they're also rebels in the in the south in, in the north that were fighting against that you know regime as well, and you know if you have a regime that is controlling a whole military and has all the equipment, it doesn't matter what kind of military you are. And most people in 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 uh, the rebels didn't have sophisticated weapons because they didn't have the money to be able to get that money to be able to fight back, right? So. Um, Anyway, so that was one. And then I think that one was religious aspect of it because Sudan is, you know, both Christian, you know, Muslim, um, and also 
amnesty or people who just believe in you know their own gods mm. and sudan you know south sudan is not everybody is a christian in south sudan right and people lived happily people were okay with that but then when people just realize that there's going to be sharia law and this kind of stuff they can you know going to restrict people of what they can do and whatnot people are like oh no this is just too much for me i can't do this right um i, I think if south sudan was like australia where australia doesn't have like religion thing it's not a secular country so there's no religion thing in the government information or institution or anything sudan could have like you know survived that way but there's that and then there's the oil. i don't know if i'm correct with most of it but i think close to the correctness of what i read on the internet um, yes. and what i was told so um but uh, yeah so that's that's how the war is and i think there's so many other complications there's also tribal wars in south sudan right people grabbing each other's land i think the land thing has been it's like i think it's a human thing right yeah. human just loves to grab lands and 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 in south sudan i think that it's happening all the time because you have people that have kettles and people that don't have kettles people who are farmers and so there's always a fight you know you know you know you bring a kettle to my to my land and in the grace of everything and then you're like oh you know why would you do that right so you fight back like you can't do that um i think there's that there's that boundary that people haven't yet figured out how to respect it if you will i think once people start to respect those boundaries I think South Sudan will find its way back again to like, I, I don't know, back again to what, but maybe to a better future because I don't know there was any good back then. Yeah. So you moved to camp four years at a refugee camp. How long did you, did you live in the refugee, refugee camp? Um, I lived in a refugee camp for 13 years. 13 years? Yeah. 13 Whoa. brutal years, my friend. From I can imagine what life was like in there. Like, so yeah. y'all stay so long just because there's nowhere, nowhere better to go or like government politics got involved or like 13 years, that's a long time. Yeah, man. So the hope is that every refugee that lives in a refugee camp is that you want to get out of there mm -hmm. to a better country. You want to go to the US, you want to go to Canada, you want to go to Australia, you want to go to UK um, because African countries want to take an African, you know, to become citizens in their country. They have their own issues too. So that was not happening. If somebody, if South Africa say, hey, I will take other you know refugees in africa we would go like being in south africa probably will give us more opportunity because south africa is like the new york of africa right it has everything that we need as far as like modern life is concerned right but um there was not much of that um and so your hope is only to expect mm -hmm. to go to a bigger to a, to a to a developed country and so that's probably why we stayed there for that long it was like some kind of lottery system you have to go through in order to like get out of there or like how's the process work to actually go to the United States or another country? I don't have a specific answer to that, but uh, I think it's close to both. I think lot lottery and uh, uh, for the most part, I think it's um, your story. I mean, lottery to me is a story mm -hmm. because you have to you have to explain to me why you deserve to go to Australia, you deserve to go to America and stuff like that. So some people fail those interviews and they're very simple interviews. We just tell them like, hey, I can't go back to my country because if I go there, I can get, I'll get killed. Um, you know, we had a good story. We, you know, my parents couldn't go back. I don't want to put too much information here because I don't know who's going to listen to this. But, you know, um, you know, but when they passed away, it was easier for us to, to uh, what do you call them? You come to the United States, right? So what's the day-to-day -day life like in the refugee camp? Like you doing the same thing every day or? Yeah, I think we do the same thing every day. We played a lot of soccer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we played a lot of soccer and I had so many hobbies that I just didn't know it was all my hobbies. I was just doing them because I was doing them. I was doing photography, um, but not like taking pictures of, you know, other hungry kids <laughs> maybe, <laughs> or anyone else uh, or birds and stuff like that. I was actually taking pictures of people who want to build memories, right? I was, you know, people come from like you know, um, high school students that want to take a picture in the uniforms, um, ladies that want to take a picture in the uniforms, ladies that want to take a picture with their boyfriends, uh, people that had weddings. So I would go and take pictures of them. People that uh, wanted to remember the greenery that happens uh, every once in a while, because once it rains, it's green and lush everywhere. Then after like three months, it's back to dry. So people like to, you know, get those moment, moments uh, what it called captured. And so I find myself doing that, um, which was pretty cool. 
And so are you like, you have to stay in the refugee camp or you can go outside or, go, or mix with the Kenyans and go to school with the Kenyans or is all everything like just in the refugee camp? Oh yeah, I mean like the good thing about the refugee camp, uh, Kenyans were everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like if I were to like, I mean like, to be honest, I'm like Kenyan because mm -hmm. I grew up in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Like everything I knew is about Kenya, not Sudan, not South mm -hmm. Sudan, not Ethiopia, mostly about Kenya. But I mean, you learn about the whole Africa, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the interaction is very common. People in a marry, like mm -hmm. in the refugee camp, if you end up marrying a Kenyan, you could become a Kenyan citizen. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard. Uh, just very few people really succeed to do that. Most people are there with a plan. The plan is to go abroad, mm -hmm. and so you don't want to mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you go back to Kenya? Have you been back since you came here? Uh, to be honest, no. No. I'm planning to, but. Um, I've been pulling it off because I didn't really see anything major that I need to go back for mm -hmm. other than, you know, to go visit my parents' grave. Mm -hmm. That's like... Do you have any family still over there? I probably do. Trust yeah. me. Like, I don't know my extended family. Mm -hmm. um, I have some family. I probably have a very large family, to be honest, that are living outside. Uh, but I, I don't know who they are. So the only people that I know are the people that I grew up with. And those are my siblings. Talk about how, how you came to the United States. Like... How did, how, how did that work out for you? How did you finally get, get over here? Yeah, so ours, um, like I said earlier, it it worked very, um, uh, very easy, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, it took us a bit of time to like wait for the process and whatnot, but- um, And you came here to Seattle? I came directly to Seattle, yeah. Okay. yeah. Any reason why you picked Seattle? I didn't pick Seattle. No, they picked it for you? They picked it for me, I think. Okay. Just, uh, what is it? the world was speaking to us to okay. bring us to Seattle. I don't know. But uh, so when we had our first interview, um, uh, what is it? Um, you know, cause so my dad was a leader back in the refugee camp. Uh, he, he was basically one of the chiefs and uh, he sometimes spoke for the whole chiefs mm -hmm. in the camps cause he was, he was an educated, educated guy and he, he spoke English. So that helped. Um, so he would do that. Um, when he passed away, um, some of his friends or colleagues who were, uh, one of them was called John, um, and there's, there's another, I think both of them are called John, I think. Um, and so they, you know, they were close family to our family. And so when we were going through the process, you know, because we were like orphans at then, that time. Um, and so they were, um, he was, he and some of them were, especially the, the one John that I know very well has been, you know, critical in making sure that our case is is heard um, and other things. And so, you know, we had a first interview and, you know, they were like, okay, you guys are an accompanied minor. There's this one lady, she's a Somali lady. Uh, she, I think Somali Kenyan, you know, uh, and uh, she was the one working on our case and she was just helping us out. Um, and so she did a really good job, you know, uh, pushing our case mm -hmm. forward faster um, so that, we don't waste too much time. Mm -hmm. Let's take this kid somewhere safer. And so um, we ended up getting the opportunity to go for an interview with the UN uh, people. And then we waited. Um, uh, I think it's like a lottery then, mm -hmm. right? Where they can throw your names to whatever Yeah, because no, they only let a certain amount of people from each country in for visas and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, the U.S. is the largest, uh, what do you go, uh, the settler mm. like it was settled a lot of people uh like over 90,000 people a year when i knew then just like literally 90 people nine, not 90,000 people maybe it's 90,000 maybe it's 10,000 people i think maybe 10,000 i don't think 90,000 people but i think 10,000 people but every year we have like 10 buses going to the airport 10 buses that's a <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> each bus takes like 60 people <laughs> you know what i mean it's a lot yeah 16 plus and you know and so there's a lot of people that always get resettled to the united states and other places canada was not as much but it was a lot of refugees too um but the u.s and the canada i think and, and australia are the largest uh resettlers of people um and so you know we went to the first interview and then we had an interview with the U with the with the u.s uh um i don't know what they call them they call the jva Joint Voluntary Agency um, that's sent by the JV by the by the United States. It's basically peoples of the the U.S. 
and then you have i'm not sure if that's correct but i'm gonna double fact check that but i know there's something called jva that's what we know <laughs> that's what i remember and then there's the ins which is a department of homeland security um they basically will go there and then they will make sure you just you know double check and make sure you're not part of al Shabaab and other terrorist organizations right uh, I mean, we didn't know what terrorist was. We just knew there was Osama bin Laden who bombarded, you know, uh, you know, uh, the Twin Towers and also Nairobi. Because yeah, people don't realize that he he got Kenya, he got Tunisia, like he did stuff over there too. Oh my goodness, that we don't we don't recognize. This guy is global. Yeah, it's global. So they want to make sure that you know, and so. That's when I realized how serious that thing was. I didn't know how serious it was. But, you know, the first, when the 9-11 happened, I saw it on the TV. And I was like, who in the, you know, right mind would do that? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like sitting there, I'm just thinking like, what is that? You know, like, that's crazy. Um, so, yeah, we had our interview and then it went really well. Um, and then uh, we had, we had medical checkup. We just make sure everybody was good, you know. So we did that, we passed that. And then um, the interview was to basically ask us um, what kind of family. Actually, the lady that interviewed me, she is in California. I, I'm connected to her still. So I want to meet her in person one day. Um, she was asked me like, what kind of family you want? And, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, I told her, you know, cause then, and I grew up in a Christian family. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I would like a Christian family and whatnot to like in love my, you know, mm -hmm. siblings unconditional. Why? Well, I do college stuff and all that kind of stuff. So just like, cool, cool. And so she, you know, um, said, okay, you know, good talking to you and stuff like that. And so, um, and then we just waited. Um, and then we were taken to Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. And then we, physically sat there for we're gonna sit there for like three months six months i think and then we ended up staying for a whole year because it was like our our medical was expired at this duration mm -hmm. and when you know if it expires then you have to go do a new medical checkup i think you have to like get vaccinated or whatever those kind of stuff so so we did that and then now uh, we flew to the united states and uh the first flight was to Belgium, and then we ended up in uh, New York. And my friend, I'll tell you a story. In New York, we had this chicken. I still remember that chicken. And I tell my girlfriend that she laughs. I'm like, it's this chicken, man. I don't know if it was KFC, but I don't think it was KFC. It tasted really good. My siblings were, you know, very young. So they were eating, they couldn't finish it. So I ate most of the chicken. It was so good. Uh, so until now, I haven't gone. So funny. <laughs> I haven't gone back to New York yet, but the moment I go to New you York, go there. I'm gonna ask people like, "Where is that chicken that I got at the airport?" Now? Nobody would know, but <laughs> I would have to go find it. That's crazy. So and then Seattle. Yeah. When, you, when they bring you here, like they give you any money to operate on, or just just drop you off in Seattle? No, you're literally just dropped off. Well, I wouldn't say just dropped off. They will drop you off to the family host that is, you know, like foster family that are gonna care for you. And so we had one that came over, very good family, loving family. We're still connected today. Um, and so they took care of us. Um, they came to the airport um to pick us up, and we saw people call us, calling us by names. They're like, who's this foreign people calling us by names? <laughs> you know, and they're looking there. And then, you know, uh, we call we call a uh, white person Mzungu. Mm -hmm. So we're like, look at Mzungu calling our name. <laughs> and they were calling it so nice. I'm like, wow, this guy is literally practice how to say our names. I mean, our names are not that really mm -hmm. difficult, to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, so there was also this one uh, South Sudanese lady who was at the airport too, as a translator, just in case. Yeah, so his family had any contact with them before or this first time you ever see no, them was like then? first time they were also ter uh terrifyingly excited i don't know why i said terrifyingly excited but they're terrifyingly like like, excited. like you're a little too happy right yeah 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 you just, just like, like he doesn't plan for us <laughs> i'm like what's going on here um no they were just like it was just so happy to meet us man like it was just the excitement that I saw, I've never seen anything like that. Like I've never admitted that to myself because like, sometimes I just tell people that I don't feel things, but I really do. And I just like, I was like, wow. You know, thinking about that, like that was a very special moment, right? It's like we landed at the airport, people are calling our names and we were just like so excited. Um, I'm sure we had like big smile on our faces mm -hmm. and they had it too, because it was very infectious. Um, and how long did y'all stay with them? Um, Actually, we're family until today. Okay. So we, 
Um, I didn't stay with the with the with the foster family. Uh, my siblings mostly did until they grew up. You know, mm-hmm. once they're eighteen, they decide to do whatever they wanted to do. Some decide to do things earlier. So it's you know whoever decided to do whatever they wanted to do. But um, I lived at a at a house with this one lady, um, and she is just she is amazing. She's lovely. Um, we lived with her for um, I don't know how many years, maybe three four years or something like that before I decided to you know you know enroll in college I think I already enrolled in college then uh, but I was just you know you know looking for places to live by myself and um, you know do the adult things that I need to do to be places you know what I mean Um, and so but she she helped us a lot Um, I've learned so many things from from her about America so that was pretty cool let me ask you this Let's suppose some, either an immigrant or refugee is landing in Seattle today. What advice would you have for this person? I, I don't really have specific advice because I really don't know what to say. I think the, the only thing I would say is, this is what people told me when I came. They're like, focus on your schooling if you really want to succeed in this country. That's what people told me. Nobody told me that go follow your dream if you have a dream. <laughs> you know, it was like, go get that degree. And, you know, immigrants, you know, they would say, become a doctor, nurse, engineer, something very safe for you. And, and I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, great. Um, I would say the same thing, but I think um, the most important part, the most important thing I would tell, you know, new immigrants is focus at becoming good at communicating with people that's one thing that immigrants sometimes have issues with because culturally that's not how we grew up you know like that's one really big one and second would be whatever you're gonna do go do it well because you're gonna compete with a lot of people out there so do it well um and don't forget where you came from because i almost forgot where i came from (laughs) So what's your point of view on this? It's like a lot of immigrants come here and they have this drive, this focus, like they'll do whatever it takes. Like if they have to like, you know, walk this is for, for two years or what do they got to do? They do it. Where most Americans are like, oh, I'm not doing that job. Or oh, that's, that's beneath me, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think a lot of Americans, you know, need that drive that immigrants bring to us. Mm-hmm. I mean, this America is the land of the immigrants, right? We forgot that we were immigrants. And the moment we forget that, we become complacent. And I think... When I came here, I took any job. Like I was a dishwasher. Um, I worked at a, yeah, I was a dishwasher. And then I worked at, I sold knives. <laughs> I sold Kirby, <laughs> those uh, Dyson things, you know what I mean? Like Kirby, I think not Dyson, but Kirby. And I did, um, I worked uh, at a nursing home. Uh, I find that very uh, common today with most immigrants who work at the nursing homes, um, um, which is which is good, but majority of them don't see mobility out of that. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to one friend of mine who works at Amazon right now when we all started. I remember that very specific time we were talking. He was wearing this green uniform for a CNA, and I was, you know, wearing mine. I think, and we were talking. Everybody that knew me then, even if I'm doing what I was doing, even if it's below me, I'm not thinking about it as it's below me. I'm just thinking of it as a stepping stone. Like I'm thinking about, I am going to be, I'm going to continue to move up, 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 regardless. If I move up even within that organization, that's great. But I am, my my mobility is not going to be hindered. Like I am going to continue to move up, right? And I think most immigrants, when they come here, they get burned out real quick because they want to move up pretty fast, right? Not only that, but they forget that they can even move faster without burning out. And then most people burn out, right? Um, And so that's 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 like another big problem that's happening. I remember like my first job after the army was I I did HR for for try to seafood in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Like you know, it's hard work, like cutting up fish or whatever. Yeah. Pretty much everyone does it from Philippines, Somalia, Ethiopia, Mm -hmm. a country in in like West Africa, right? Yeah. We're like two white people, right? Two Mm -hmm. white guys. Mm -hmm. They were both like at the Appalachian of Kentucky, like pretty much the poorest part of the United States, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like we we try to recruit people, like no one want to work up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's like it's backbreaking work. They get paid good money though, you know? Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I know I've heard some people that actually go to Alaska to do that jobs. And when I see them with the drive, I'm like, 
Is yeah. that the is I that mean, the fish money? Yeah, like, I mean, you, you can easily make eight thousand dollars a month up there easily. Because the Alaska the rule is like in most places like overtime, like I had to work forty hours a, a week. In Alaska, the first day of work is like Monday, and you work like twelve hours. That's for the overtime. It's after eight every eight hours you get overtime, right? Yeah. I know people from the Philippines, like they're like six people in their family. Yeah. Three people in Alaska, three back in the, 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 the mansion in the Philippines, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's backbreaking work, but most Americans don't want to do it, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, it is, it is, you know, it is difficult to grow up in a society where you see all your friends are getting good jobs and then mm -hmm. you, you can't get a good job and then you find yourself like you're entitled to do the same thing as your friend. And I think that's one issue that's plaguing this country. Um, I agree. And so, People should be mindful. Like I don't want to compare myself with my friends. A lot of people make a mistake. They could always compare themselves with someone else. Oh no, that's like the wrong thing to do. Because once you do that, you end up a perpetual cycle of like trying to figure out why am I not getting the job? You know yeah. what I mean? And so that creates this like depression. And once you are depressed, you're not seeing the world clearly. The world just looks gray. And so that there's no happiness in gray. You know, this is Seattle, but you have to. Have your vitamin D's, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, Tabon, how do you take care of yourself? I take care of myself by being mindful, um, uh, not to burn out. I've been burned out multiple times, and I try to work out as much as I can. So I am... You actually post videos or pictures of yourself working out, don't you? I, I do in my social, uh, not on my... I don't think about I think I posted one on my on my LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. I want to do more. The reason why I want to do that is um, you can be an engineer, you can be a doctor, you can be whatever, you can still focus on the health uh, um, fitness. And I think it's very important, right? If you want to live like, you know, long life, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but if you're going to live a long life and you want to have no like diseases, triple you or, um, or just age, that's just cripple you. You have to do fitness. Fitness allows you to do so many things. Like your body is capable of doing like, like a lot of things. And so uh, when you exercise, this is proven. It's not like I'm making it up. Like it helps you focus better. It helps you drive. It helps you just be a positive overall because you have, you know, you are um, sweating all this like stress away and you're in a different mental zone. Like you are giving your body the love it needs. And, and so uh, I do that. Um, and, you know, I used to like to hang out a lot with people just to like take my mind away from work. And I haven't done it in a long time. So I'm um, right now, the reason why I'm here is literally to just do hang out with you, <laughs> my friend. Yes. And I think that's one important thing. Like, yeah, just try to hang out with people. Um, that that's very, you know, very good for our holistic life. And I think, you know, if you can do workouts, you know, there's other things that you can do for brain um, improvement. Um, if you want for muscles, you could do other things. People that don't have legs still work out. There's no excuse. So, you, you know, you have a lot of stuff going on, like most people. How do you prioritize every day? Like, how do you make sure you work on things one and two versus things 19 and 20? Oh, my goodness. That's, a, that's one thing that I struggle with every day. But I excuse me, but I think I found something to do. And what is it? Um, I basically try to plan out what I want to work on and then figure out how, like I said earlier, if there, there's no dependency, right? There's really no way I'm going to succeed in both of them at the same time. So I'm going to have to focus on only one. And then if I actually do that really well, then maybe there could be some dependencies that can help me with the second task and stuff like that. So I try to focus on one thing at a time. I never used to do that. I would do like, I'll split my day in a half, like from AM to like two, I work on one thing. And when I get frustrated and I'm just not making progress, I will shut it down. I'll go to the next one, hoping that, you know, there's some sort of like bulb, you know, where I can actually continue. And I think it was really detrimental to how I was building things. I've decided to like work on one thing at a time. So I could spend a week working on one thing. And then once I get that done, and then I spend on the week working on a different thing. And then as I'm getting done every time, I'm just realizing that, oh, this is what I was trying to do previously on that other, uh, what do you call, solution I was building. And then I will basically use the same idea that I was, you know, because it's relevant to this project. So, and, and that's how I do it. Um, 
I try to spend as much time with my little girl because that's, you know, like if I don't do that, um, I'm going to beat myself up. <laughs> um, and I try to do that as much. Um, I'm, we, you know, we had, we had some issues sometimes where, you know, it's hard for my girlfriend and I to find time to work, you know, to like hang out and whatnot. And so that's been like, you know, it's been a big problem. Like, if, like everyone in America has that issue because we have to work to pay our bills it does you know look if we were able to like work for 30 hours a week and have money to do everything i will go for that i i, I think i will be equally innovative and creative as working 70 hours a week working 30 hours a week because i will have the time and the freedom to sit down and think clearly and that's one thing that we have in here. The reason why we're having so many mistakes that are happening, there's a lot of mistakes happening in the 70 hours of work, right? But those 70 hours, those mistakes could be prevented. Mm -hmm. If you take care of yourself, if you prioritize what you're working on, if you hang out more with the people that you love, if you um, find time to, there's, there's gotta be, yeah, there's, sometimes it's, it's hard to find time to hang out with people, but if you can put that effort to it, I think it's very important. Um, but I try to balance everything as much as I can without trying to like feel stressed all the time. How do you do your schedule? Like, are you working every day, 12 hours a day? Do you like take weekends off? Like, how do you do your schedule? Uh, I don't have a set schedule because since I am self-employed, um, so self-employed, what I do is, on Mondays, if I don't have a lot of, um, what do you call, um, a lot of um, things going on on my calendar, um, that's the day where I would focus extremely on engineering because no one is interrupting me. And then on Tuesday, if I have a lot of meetings, then I'll work less and I'll try to enjoy that day because after like three meetings, I'm done. Like, you know, brain wise, that thing is just like, it shudders you. Right, I mean, Zoom calls and all this kind of stuff. So, like, we get really tired, and so, um, um, yeah. So then I'll take you know a time off. Um, I, I, my, like, I usually come home at six, right? Okay. Um, I'm trying to come home early. Like, I want to come home at like five, so I can have like two hours of just hanging out with everybody and like eating food or uh, going for a walk. And then when everybody sleeps, I'll work for another three hours. <laughs> And then I go to bed and then wake up at seven, go to the gym. Um, if I, sometimes I'll wake up really early, um, but trust me, I'm already at that age where I can't wake up early and be as energetic as I used to because we have a child that can wake up yeah. at 4 a.m. And then I have to stay with her up for another two yeah. hours. My kid is very advanced. Um, she does things. She's, she's only one years old. She can walk, she can run. Oh. She wants to already walk. So her brain is literally functional like a dad's. Like it's it's like processing a lot of things. And so, um, so yeah, I I I don't want to go out of the topic, but I just find myself sometimes just, you know, um, wanting to spend more time with my little girl. But also when the time is taken at night, then during the day, then I feel really tired. Then I will have to just focus on small things here and there. Can you talk some more about your own entrepreneur journey? Yeah, um, my entrepreneurial journey, I think it started when I started to build things when I was like 10. And here's, here's the fun part. When I was building those little things, those little models, um, people liked it and they say that, hey, could you help me build something? And I was like, I was like okay, cool, I can help you. And then I'll help them build something. Um, as I started doing that, I started to like sell like people was trying to buy my things. And so I would basically sell them, right? Um, then I went into doing barber. Like I cut my own hair. Like I, don't, I save money, right? I wish I was like you. I don't have to cut hair. <laughs> my hair just could grow. Um, but that's what I do. So I found a way to make money through that. Um, and then uh, building shelves and stuff like that. Building chimneys. That's one thing that my uncle likes a lot when I talk about the chimneys. It's like you build chimneys from the mud. I'm like, yes. Um, You've done it all. I've done it all. I did blacksmith, you know. Um, I think entrepreneurship is in my DNA because my mom was an entrepreneur. My dad was more of like the academia kind of person. Um, he went to school, 
a lot, <laughs> but my mom was making money. Um, it was, she was taking care of the family. She was brewing alcohol, which was illegal, but she was brewing alcohol and getting people drunk and making money. And so, um, you know, where there's, where there's no way, there's a way. So I learned that, um, that that would be a legal thing, but, you know, in the refugee camp, there's no really rules in place. Mm -hmm. So you can do whatever you want, but in most places you'll have to have a license and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, she did that and she also does knitting. She would like, cur she would like design really beautiful flowers, right? And uh, she would sell those ones. Then there's somebody who actually sells them to the United States. So she makes them and give them to somebody who is traveling to the United States and they'll sell it for like seven grand or something, $700, I think. Because those are handmade and they are beautiful. So what's been some pros and cons for you of being an entrepreneur? Oh, pros and cons is being sometimes broke, sometimes with money. <laughs> and that has been, um, and the most part broke too. So like, you know, after like, you work for a bigger company, you realize how much money you have. And then you're like, why would I want to go back to not having money? You know what I mean? But I think the, the, the hardest part is just scaling, knowing the right things to do at the right time. And we don't usually tend to have that as, you know, as entrepreneurs, right? We're still figuring things out every day. And I find myself just, you know, sometimes drained, right? Like, what am I going to do next, right? I find myself struggling with that. Um, and also, you know, imposter syndrome is also <laughs> part of it. It's all accumulating. So, um, and then the good part is, you know, when you network with other people, network, and then you realize that they are also going through the same problem. So you're like, oh, wow, we are, I'm not the only person who's suffering. And sometimes you realize, oh, maybe I'm not so far behind. Yeah, exactly. You're like, wow. And then some good things happen, right? You raise money and then you're building and then momentum kind of dies a little and then you try to pick up back again. And then you forget how far you've actually come, you exactly. know? Exactly. I have forgotten about how far I've come all the time. People tell me how far I've come and I look at them like, you guys, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. I want to be there. They're like, well, here's, here's one thing that you need to know about life. Appreciate all the small success that yeah. you're, you're, you're gaining. And if you st stop to, you know, if you start to discount them, then, you know, um, there's not enough. Yeah, it's, it's, def it's, it's definitely a challenge to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, talk about how you do your idea, idea validation. Like, what is that? Like, how do, you, how do you validate your product to make sure you can actually sell it? Um, I mean, like most of the products that I've been helping out are not mine. So okay. they were all mostly clients. And the ones that I know that can do well, I basically take an equity out of it. So I've been taking equities from a lot of some really good products that I know that are going to do really well. And um, the good thing about that is I'm also invested in the product as I'm building it because I know the product for sure will do really well, right? So that's, for the most part, I think um, this product were already validated by the owners. So I don't really have to put much effort to it. The only effort that I do is engineering wise. Um, I ask questions why the one thing is done the way it's done. Have they thought about this way? Have they thought about the other way? Um, so my goal is to basically help them figure out ways to grow um, and also innovate within that same product that they're building. Um, as far as like products that I try to build myself, I think um, one is, do I want the product? Like, do I find any need for it? And I, I'm trying to not build, like, this is what I used to do before. Like, I just used to build fun things. But now I'm like thinking, is it going to affect me directly? If it's not, I'm not going to spend my time in it. The reason why is I will not be as motivated as a person who actually sees the problem that this thing is solving, right? And, and because I'm a self-starter, if I start and then I realize it's not something that I need, I am going to start something else that I need. And so I try to not spend my time on that. So what I do is usually I just like, and I've started this one just recently, is like ask questions with the product that I'm building. And um, usually the right people that actually would need the product. As soon as I like know I want it, I'll ask somebody else who, who might need it. And, you know, sometimes I find like really good feedback, like one, two, three, five, seven people. It's not enough, you know, and here's a good thing. If you want to validate your product, ask a stranger, 
Exactly. Don't ask somebody you love, somebody you know. They are always going to give you positive, uh, what do you call, uh, feedback. And there's only one person in my family that I know that will like give me a positive feedback, and that's the person I go to. And that person always asks me like, "Why would you want to build this?" I mean, he has the money. Like he worked for bigger companies, he made enough money, and so I can't like like it has to solve a problem. He's not gonna cut me a check, mm. and he has never cut me a check for a product. But for school, he did. He's like, yeah, get that me school. I'm like, all right, cool. But product wise, like now I want to know what that product is solving. And have you made revenue? You know, I have mentors, and my mentors are always helping me because I ask them questions. Mm. You know, I would give them my pitch deck, like this is what the product needs to do. And this is how it's going to work. So if the comments come back in my, in my, in my, uh, in my deck, like, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Have you thought of this? And I'm, I will sit down, I'm like, wow, how come this person thought of this without me thinking about it first? So every time as an entrepreneur, I'm always developing a next step thinking, like, what is the next step? Like, I know what the product is going to do, but what is next, right? Because you know this, if you talk to an investor, they're asking some unreal things sometimes. <laughs> they expect you to know all this stuff. Like, yo, yeah. I am not an investor. I'm not going to know what investors know. That's why investors need to understand how entrepreneurs build things. If the investor was a previous startup uh, person that sold, that's the right person. If the person only has their mommy and daddy's fam, you know, money, and maybe just join another company because they studied finance, finance, <laughs> you know, and um, or they're doctors and then they have money and whatnot, usually not the right person to advise you as far as like, or get feedback from as far as like the product you're building. But if the product is in, in their industry, like if it's in uh, healthcare and then healthcare, then that's the right person to ask. Yeah. So you have to pick the right people to ask. Connect with as many people as you can, but find the right people that will give you the right feedback, right? Um, so that's what I try to do as much as I can. And I don't think I'm learning every day. Um, I don't think I have found the right answer. Um, I'm just always figuring out what's the best way. I mean, like some people would write out a questionnaire and they'll send out. I think those are great. But if I'm not really interacting with people, I don't feel like I'm actually getting feedback. Like people can write whatever. How do I know what this is what you're thinking? No, guess me. Like you go, like you, you start a pitch competition, and let's say you have three minutes of pitch, right? You do your three minute pitch, and all these people are like you should have said this, you should have done that. You yeah. where's this slide? Where's that slide? And you're like, well, and you can't say well because I only have three minutes, right? So yeah. you just had to, you're like, just had to take it, right? Yeah. And we're and we're like pitch decks. You know, I always say like you can give a pitch deck to 25 people. Yeah. You got 25 different opinions. Yeah. So you just got to go with what you trust your best. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So is there anything I, I should have asked you that I didn't know? Anything else you want to talk about? Um, I think you've asked me. You've exhausted everything <laughs> in most cases. If there's anything, maybe something that I don't remember. So, um, but for the most part, you've asked all the questions. Yeah, you've asked everything. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, my uh, I don't give people my Instagram and my Facebook. I just give people my LinkedIn. It's, okay. it's just Taban E. Cosmos. Um, that's that's where people can find me. Nice. Yeah. And My you, go ahead. And can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, you know, um, that's a good one. Let me figure out what to say. Um, I think as entrepreneurs or just as humans, if you want to build something, um, just get started building it. Um, but also be mindful, you know, uh, the people that you're working with because, you know, respect those people because if you don't the sort of people that are going to help you build your product. So um, that's, I think, what I would say. I think that's, it's important for the developer community, not developer community, but the startup community and also the investor community. So that brings up a good question I want to ask you. Like as a startup found entrepreneur, like basically anything in life, right? There's always these people, like a lot of people are going to help you and do good stuff for you. There are a lot of scam bars out there, right? A lot of like quote unquote startup coaches want to charge you money and take advantage of you. How do you like see through all the noise and like, Pick the right people to help you out versus getting scammed, so to speak. Yeah. Um, if anyone wants to mentor you or do something with you, uh, but ask for money, just run away. Um, people that I've met uh, that have helped me today, 
none of them asked me for a penny. Um, and most of them were actually interested in me, not interested in what I was doing, right? They were interested in me. They wanted to know me for me. Like, because the thing is, in order to like find somebody to work with really well, I need to know who Jason is. Mm -hmm. Like, how does Jason think? If I know how you think, then it helps. It actually helps me to be able to frame the, com the communication in a way that's going to help Jason. And so I think people have to just find people that are actually really interested in their well-being as opposed to somebody who is, if somebody's telling you always like, the bone you're working too hard, you know, you have to really think about taking care of yourself. That's somebody you probably want to know, somebody you want to have as a friend. Uh, I think that's important. And, and, and one more question. So for your future, are you trying to become like a CTO of Amazon? Are you trying to build the next unicorn company as a startup? Huh, I don't know if I want, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to build something, but I, I wouldn't tell you necessarily what it is. I think I'll just let the wind blow me wherever it needs to go. Um, but I really don't want public, um, um, like I don't want to be like, what's the right word? I don't want to be like Elon Musk. Like, okay, you want to be like in the background, so to speak. I want to be in the background. Okay. Yeah, I've I've helped multiple companies, and I think as they succeed, I want the 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 owners to to be the public eye of those companies. I want to be like the background guy. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to. Yeah, it's just it attracts so much attention. So you I, want to be like the, the Wozniak of someone Steve Jobs? Something like that. I think that would yeah for me, that would be much better. That's what I would think. Um, but if I do become a CTO of another company, then fantastic. Um, usually CTOs don't make too much noise. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I've learned, but I think I will probably end up becoming a CEO depending on what I think that product is. But if I find myself becoming a CEO, then of course you have to do that public thing. Um, but in most cases, I would want to just be a silent um, partner or silent whatever. Javon, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. This is like the first time I've opened up a lot. Um, you asked, you know, some really good questions and it's f so easy to talk to you. Um, and I uh, really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.